Hello, everyone. If you could sit down, please take your seats. We will start at exactly 30 minutes past. Okay, so if you could please take your seats, we will start in two minutes. So, I see everyone is seated now and I got your attention, so welcome to, uh, to this uh, debate, um, this conference hosted by a member of the European Parliament, Dragos uh, Tudorace. Um, I'm Kruy Hasselbalk and I am your moderator for the entire day. Uh, I'm the research lead of the International Outreach Initiative for Human-Centric Approach to AI in touchai.eu in short. And I was also in the high-level group on AI, so I'm of course thrilled and honored to act in this role on uh, this debate uh, on artificial intelligence and the future of Europe. Now before passing the word to uh, Mr. Tudorace, uh, for the welcoming remarks, I want to remind you that we have a really tight schedule today. We will have many experts and a limited time, so we have to stick to the agenda. I also want to let you know that the uh, debate is live streamed. Now to the agenda of today, uh, what we'll be discussing is, is, a, is AI. It's uh, not just a technology, it is what I like to call AI social technical infrastructures of power. They form the architecture of democracy, and they can also be the accelerators of uh, defense and attack. And uh, so, of course, today we have two different uh, parts of the program. One uh, first part will focus on European security and defense, the second on European democracy. 
And of course, we are today also taking point of departure in the EU's unique position in this current, not only AI uh, contest on excellence and, and market uh, excellence, but also on uh, values. We have the EU's adopted and proposed regulations and strategies on data, the digital market, and AI, and we will also see these discussed today. We also have to be remindful that uh, what has matured over a longer period of time what has some things even carved in stone are now being dismantled in um, a new reality of pandemic and war in Europe. And this is, of course, also a point of entry of today's debate. Each of our panels today, we have two panels, uh, will be introduced by a keynote and then three panelists. And between the two debates, we'll have today's only break, 15 minutes. Uh, it is very short, and you have to be, I have to ask you to be back here at four. Uh, Precisely because we will have uh, already uh, two keynotes and then the second debate. And even when this finishes, please stay seated and at the end of the day because we will also have a keynote directly after that. Um, and now let me invite our host of today's event, Mr. Tuduace. And uh, you will also be introducing our first keynote speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gri. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone, and many thanks for, for coming to this event. I don't know whether it is the first physical event for, for most of you or some of you, or the second or the third. For me, it's the third, but still feels awkward. Uh, in any case, it is a pleasure to, to welcome you today. And probably many of you know or remember that we first scheduled uh, this event on the 1st of December, so only a short three months away, and it was exactly with the same agenda. We had the geopolitics of AI, AI in security and defense, AI and democracy, all under the umbrella of AI in the future of the Union. But back then, we saw leveraging technology to strengthen security and democracies as an element of a necessary ambition we should have for tomorrow, a positive and proactive agenda for the future. What has just happened a month ago, with a brutal invasion by Russia of Ukraine, has elevated, I think, this discussion from a discussion about ambitions of the future to a discussion about imperatives of today. And I also add a, a personal confession to this. About three, four years ago, I knew almost nothing of AI, or I knew as much of AI as anyone in the street. And I remember that I read an article I read an article not about the, the technical standards or the discussions that we have on a daily basis right now about bias and safety and industry uptake and innovation. The article was about a forecast of how AI is going to change our societies on how it leverages on the way our states are structured in the way our security is going to be structured. And those issues instantly resonated because those were the issues that actually I always cared about. They were the issues that pushed me into politics, and those were the issues that are most dear to my heart. And that is also when I realized that the conversation on AI is not only a conversation about technical standards. It is a conversation about the future of the world as we know it. It is about the contest between democracy and autocracy. It is about the security of our citizens and about the defense of our values. And it is about the global architecture of the future digital world in which we, as a union, alongside its US partner and other like-minded countries, should play an important role. This one idea that artificial intelligence will transform our societies structurally, deeply, in profound and yet unpredictable ways has been a key driver of my mandate in Parliament, it is driven by this idea that I have advocated for the establishment of AIDA, and I'm happy that the Parliament had the foresight, and I thank, I see already our President, uh, Roberta Metzola, uh, I thank the Parliament for actually having the foresight to establish that committee that has just uh, concluded its mandate yesterday, and it's also driven by those ideas that I have invited you all here today to discuss how we leverage AI to support our security in our democracies. The goal of our conversation today is to look beyond this mandate, in which we have already put forth ambitious legislation for regulating the digital world, including AI. 
but we should be looking past this mandate. We should be looking at how we will leverage artificial intelligence and more generally cutting edge technologies in Europe, in the US, again, as I said, in other like-minded countries as well. We should look at our goals and we should be looking again at the fabric of what makes us who we are, at the values of what makes us here in Europe or the United States uh, leaders of the free world. So I'm looking forward to finding some answers to these questions today. And with that, I'm thrilled to welcome President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, and I will give her the floor. Thank you very much, Roberta, for being with us. Thank you so much, uh, Dragos, for your welcome, uh, dear NATO Deputy Secretary General, dear Executive Vice President of uh, uh, the European Commission, dear Commissioners, dear colleagues, dear friends. It is uh, truly a pleasure for me to be able to take the floor uh, with you uh, and speak about artificial intelligence and the future uh, of Europe. Many of us have yet, I think, fully uh, grasped just how profoundly the artificial intelligence revolution will affect our economies, our democracies, and our collective security. Much also remains to be learned about the power and limits of artificial uh, intelligence technologies. And this is why important conversations and decisions need to be made now in order to be able uh, to allow us to reap uh, the benefits of the advantages of the AI innovation while prevent, preventing its malign uses, if uh, I can use that word. First question we ask, how can the European Union best be prepared to defend and compete in the era of artificial intelligence for the sake of our common prosperity and security? The answer is we cannot do this alone. The answer is in coming together, in dialogue, and educating each other about the opportunities and the risks that are unfolding with AI. The answer is in using what you just were, what you said, uh, Dragos, foresight capacities and technological acumen in order to anticipate what is ahead and heighten our level of preparedness. From the European Parliament's perspective, uh, lawmakers need uh, committed partners in industry, in academia and in civil society that have the technological insight that legislators might lack. And here it is where we need your expertise. And given the deteriorating security landscape on the European continent, we also need to collaborate closely with like-minded allies to tighten our security and defense and build a safer and freer world for the artificial intelligence era. Artificial, artificial intelligence is, of course, an inspiring technology. Its uh, power will offer tools that will improve modern day living and its rapid groundbreaking advances will find most useful applications that soon we will wonder how we ever managed without. And in leveraging artificial intelligence, scientists marvel about astonishing progress in fields ranging from bio bi biology to astrophysics to medical care. That said, artificial intelligence may also be weaponized uh, and be a source of conflict in the future. Uh, foes with, at times, obscure identities are already using AI-enabled disinformation attacks to sow division in democracies and tamper with the so-called our sense of reality. And AI-powered cyber attacks can no longer be considered science fiction. And that is why the European Parliament was amongst the first institutions to adopt uh, recommendations on future AI rules. I myself was a substitute member of, uh, of uh, the Parliament's Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in uh, the Digital Age, AIDA, and this topic is important. It's important for me, it's important uh, for us, for the Parliament uh, that is emerging from a very difficult uh, two years of a pandemic, 
uh, into a very uncertain future from a security point of view, uh, from a climate point of view, from a food crisis point of view. So I think that when we use that word, uh, foresight, and we ourselves as policymakers and legislators, we need to be much better at anticipating what could happen, at being in constant dialogue with our partners, such as yourself, in order to be able, first of all, to work on the excellent groundwork done by uh, AIDA Chair Dragos Tudorace over the past uh, year, but also uh, to prepare for the discussions at the European Parliament around the Artificial Intelligence Act. Last few words, Artificial Intelligence offers an opportunity also to strengthen our technological capacities to make our union fit for the digital uh, transition. And to stay competitive, uh, we must remain open-minded and calibrate regulations uh, in order, first of all, to stimulate innovation and uh, job-creating growth for our businesses, allow for a level playing field and stimulate investments in research uh, development, ensure data uh, availability, and all while seeking global alliances to set standards together. And speaking on behalf of uh, a European Parliament that proudly upholds uh, uh, human rights, uh, we need a strong emphasis on ethics and the responsible application of artificial intelligence. We must create trustworthy, human-centric technology and address uh, the potential of misuse. And moreover, in order to reap the benefits of this important digital transition, we must make sure, we say it too often, but we don't implement it, we don't go far enough to ensure that we leave nobody behind. And in this particular case, uh, if we upscale on digital skills and use the talent that we have, we have to make sure that female talent that is so often overlooked in this field must become uh, central to our work, current and future, because ultimately this increases informed consumer choice and protection. As the invasion of Ukraine shatters the peace we have long known in Europe, we also today need to assess, not reassess, assess Europe's security and defense policy. And here AI can play an essential role and partnership initiatives with allies on AI such as the AI pillar of the EU-US Trade and Technology Council and NATO allies cooperative work based off uh, the NATO artificial intelligence strategy will bring us forward. We also know that the war in Ukraine is an information war. Uh, when we look at uh, various uh, cyber interference and cyber disinformation that have tam tampered with our elections and our uh, democracies have been affected. In fact, at the moment, uh, we have an ongoing agreement with our colleagues in the Ukrainian parliament, the Verhofna Rada, in order to ensure that their security from this point of view continues to be protected. We have had an agreement with the parliament since 2015. It has recently and continues to be enlarged in order to address, but this is where being prepared uh, being efficient in the way we take decisions is necessary uh, in this period of such um, uncertainty. And all in all, uh, if in Europe, when we talk about our citizens, when we talk about our children, how they are educated, where they're receiving their uh, information from, where we discuss the merits of the artificial intelligence, the risks of misinformation, I think we must collectively become more digitally savvy and create global alliances that work harder to safeguard our digital autonomy. And today, to that end, your discussions today are extremely important. Dragos, thank you uh, for organizing uh, such an event. It was one of the first events I think we talked about, either just before or after my election. You were one of the first ones to get into the calendar, and you were the most unmovable part of the calendar. So I thank you for that, your persistence, but also your leadership. Uh, the parliament would not be able uh, 
to take such important decisions and have such important discussions without the work that you do, without the work that your colleagues do, and ultimately without the work that we can do together uh, with you. Uh, so I look forward to what we can say is a new balanced path between uh, opportunities, full respect of our democratic values, and ultimately risks. But I'm really happy to be able to engage with you today, but also uh, whenever we have the opportunity on such vital issues for our democracy and wish you every success in your work. Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you, uh, Mrs. Metzola. Um, so we are ready for our first panel of today, and I would like to invite our panelists to come to the, to the floor. And, and while you're walking, um, I can say a few words about this panel. It is on AI in European security and defense, and uh, basically it's about the role of AI in um, EU's, this EU strive towards a strategic autonomy, developing defense cap capabilities now and in the future. It's uh, building military capabilities, complementary, as we heard before, interoperable with allies, and also in terms of how our EU values factors into this. But to start this panel, uh, I want to introduce our keynote speaker of the panel, NATO Deputy Secretary General, Mr. Mircea Giovanna. He's here with us uh, to deliver the keynote speech online. Uh, please. Mr. Giorana. Uh, thank you. Uh, merci. Multumes uh, Dragos. Uh, C'est la semaine de la francophonie. Donc, uh, à l'OTAN, nous avons deux langues officielles. Et uh, c'est toujours un plaisir de, de parler uh, le français et d'être avec vous. Thank you so much, uh, Dragos. Thank you so much for inviting me again. And to the honorable members of the committee, uh, thank you all for allowing me to speak at the beginning of this very important meeting. Unfortunately, we meet at a dark time for our security because the violence in Ukraine rages on. So far, while the weapons uh, uh, Mr. Putin has employed um, have been uh, more conventional, uh, and we look at Russia's strategy to being a medieval one, indiscriminate bombings, targeting of homes, of hospitals, of schools, and kindergartens, um, cutting the power and water supplies to the city of Mariupol, all leading to a humanitarian catastrophe. And the brutality of Putin's plan is clear for all of us to see. At the same time, we have to, while focusing on, on, uh, on this barbaric war and taking all measures to help our Ukrainian friends and also doing everything we can to strengthen NATO and to strengthen uh, the Euro-Atlantic community. We should not lose sight of, of the other side uh, and the other dimensions of security, because as we are looking at more traditional war warfare, cyber warfare is also a well-rehearsed part of Russia's playbook. It has persistently used cyber attacks on NATO allies and partners alike. In the next few days, you'll be seeing more evidence and more attribution of such attacks and uh, also the use of artificial intelligence and capabilities uh, for many years have been in the arsenal of, of, of Russia and also, of course, of China. China is another authoritarian challenger, and uh, uh, she has stated that it tends to be the world's leading player in the field of artificial intelligence by the end of the decade, and they are investing accordingly. So technology is moving fast, so we must uh, move even faster to retain our technological edge that helped us uh, keep ourselves safe for, for more than 70 years. And this is why I believe that NATO and EU, we should try to, to do as much as we, as we can together. Let me tell you a few things about AI uh, in NATO. It's an obvious priority for us. I chair the Innovation Board in NATO. We pay attention every single day to this very important dimension. Allies are already using AI tools to improve the maintenance of our military equipment to better understand and counter disinformation. And NATO Science and Technolo Technology Organization has a network of over 6,000 scientists and engineers all over the Alliance, dedicated to integrating the most advanced technologies, including AI, into NATO systems. 
such as next generation uh, of early warning aircraft, autonomous maritime vehicles for minesweeping, a case in the Black Sea, which is now developing. Last October, Allies agreed our very first AI strategy. It sets standards for the responsible use of AI in accordance with international law, outlines how we will accelerate the adoption of AI in areas such as training and exercises, and sets out how we will protect this technology. And of course, it addresses the threats posed by the use of AI by adversaries. So in a world where global rules are increasingly under attack, or in some portions, global rules are not existent, NATO is setting the standard, as we have done for seven decades, when it comes also to the ethical use of AI in the defense and security realm. And here NATO is working with allies and partners, including European Union, the OECD, the UN, Going hand in hand with our work in NI, allies also have endorsed a new data exploitation framework policy. And because we know all that data fuels the successful use of AI. This will allow NATO to fully realize the benefits of the many different types of data collected, stored and processed within the Alliance. Our approach to new technologies goes far wider than just AI. We are also looking at autonomous systems, quantum computing, which is coming faster than we anticipate, we have indications from industry that quantum will be operational before the end of this decade, biotechnologies, space, and hypersonics. And to really seize the opportunities and mitigate the risks presented by these new emerging and disruptive technologies, we need to work more closely with the private sector, with the, with the, with the, with the big players, but also with the startups, which is where much of today's innovation and tomorrow's success is taking place. So the NATO summit last summer, through our NATO 2030 initiative, we took concrete steps to boost transatlantic innovation and to encourage new startups to enter the market. We are developing as we speak, and we'll have it uh, up and running pretty soon, our Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, uh, DIANA is an acronym, to facilitate transatlantic cooperation on critical technologies. And also we have recently launched the new 1 billion euro NATO Innovation Fund to invest and put some seed money into cutting edge startups that will help meet our security uh, needs. And I expect both of these initiatives to be in place by our Madrid summit in late June. Both Diana and the fund will leverage the vast pool of talent that we have in our 30 nations. So across our alliance, and of course in the European Union, we have an abundance of excellent academic institutions, the finest researchers, and incredibly creative companies. In our open societies, where our people are free to question, to challenge, and to innovate, we, are, we have a significant advantage to the development of these new technologies. But we must do a better job in grasping the full potential of our system. Because the others are making, like China, a fusion between state and industry. And in many, many uh, of these new technologies, they uh, either have or intend to have advantage over us, which is something that should be of common concern, both to NATO, to the EU, and to the democratic world. The war in Ukraine also underlines the importance of strengthening our collective defense and making sure we are ready to respond to any threat in every domain, including cyber. There can be no room for complac complacency at this new reality. NATO here, this is something that we take very seriously. One word about NATO and European Union. I heard uh, the comments before. Uh, I salute the fact that uh, the European Council of last week, in the same day with the NATO summit and the G7 summit, and President Biden attending uh, the European Council, that the EU has adopted this strategic compass. That's a very good development that we salute. As we know, we are working towards Madrid for our strategic concept. And even if these two documents are not at the same level of importance in both organizations, for us, the concept is the second document after the Washington Treaty, we have the obligation to make sure that synergies, new synergies between NATO and EU are identified. We hope to have the new joint declaration between NATO and EU done as soon as possible. We are already thinking of four new domains of cooperation between NATO and EU. One is resilience, including cyber resilience. Another one is EDTs, and here we have to do a much better work in aggregating and leveraging our resources. We cannot afford to compete amongst the transatlantic family. Of course, I, I hear the words of 
strategic autonomy and independence, and the EU has all the right in the world, I'm a EU citizen myself, to do that. But let's make sure that by um, not working in, in sync, we might be losing the leverage of the 1 billion people living in our alliance and the 30 allies that are also, other than EU member states, are also very important in, into this. So I can reassure you from here, from the other side of the city, from NATO HQ, that we mean business when working with the EU. You need us, we need you. Let's do a better job together. And what better fresh field for our cooperation than AI, data exploitation, new technologies. And Dragos, thank you so much for your leadership in this. And to all my friends in the European Parliament and in the European Union, uh, best regards from NATO. Uh, we are more united than ever. And I, I, I think that never NATO EU have been closer than we are now. Let's keep that unity and let's keep invest, investing in our, in our fresh energy, in our endeavor. Thank you so very much. Is it like, yeah, okay, thank you, Mr. Giovanna. Um, so let's begin this uh, first panel of today. Um, and I want to introduce you to you the three uh, panelists uh, that we have here. We have CEO of the Special Compet Competitive Studies Project and former executive director of the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, Mr. Il Bayraktari. We have uh, Tobias Vestner, Head of Security Law and uh, Security and Law Program at G the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And then Torsten Reil, uh, founder and CEO of uh, the company Helsing. Um, and um, starting this panel, I would like to invite uh, each of you to, uh, to give a few introductory remarks. And, and let's uh, first hear from you, Mr. Il Bayraktari. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, Dragos, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have worked really closely with Dragos for the last couple of years. Um, just a quick background about the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence that I led for the last three years. Um, I think on the US side, uh, United States Congress really understood, like the European Parliament, the transformative nature of the artificial intelligence. So about three years ago, they created uh, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Um, the mandate compared to what Dragos is leading uh, was a little bit different because I think the reason why United States Congress created the AI Commission was that they were looking at what the Deputy Secretary General of NATO was talking about, all the uh, rhetoric coming out of Beijing about the efforts and the strategy and resources they were putting towards uh, getting ahead in all uh, in all aspects of emerging technologies, but specifically in terms of artificial intelligence. And I think United States Congress was really concerned with the fact that if we don't get uh, the necessary steps to get organized and resourced, we might really fall behind in this critical technology that not only, not only has implications for national security, like Deputy Secretary General of NATO said, but it would have a wide ranging implications for our society and our economy. And so with that in mind, uh, we, we, we worked for about two and a half years, and last year we produced for the Congress our final report. And I just quickly want to go through, uh, you know, some of the key themes from our final report because I think it's really, uh, you know, like timely for, for what Dragos and his team are trying to achieve here in Europe. Uh, so although the focus of our report compared to what Dragos is leading here in Europe was purely from a national security angle, we, we had to address a lot of other uh, side things that enable successful adoption and deployment of AI. And so just quickly going through some of the key themes from our report, uh, there were four, I call it buckets of recommendations we provided to Congress and the White House. Number one is we really pushed hard on this needs to be led by the highest level of our government because getting this technology right needs the attention and the focus and resources. So we provided recommendations about how we need to get organized, what our departments and agencies need to do to get ahead of this technology, and what is the necessary so like leadership attention that is required to stay ahead in this competition uh, for such a critical technology. 
The second bucket of recommendations, which I think you guys in Europe are trying to address as well, is the issue evolving talent. Uh, this is a critical enabler of how do we get ahead in, in terms of AI. So we have recommendations in our final report of how to build a domestic STEM pool talent, uh, because in the United States every year there are about 70,000 people that graduate from uh, computer science schools, but there are 300,000 job opportunities that are open every year. So the supply demand issue here is really difficult uh, to balance, and so you, we need to invest in the United States more in terms of like growing the domestic pool talent of individuals. We also need to uh, fix our immigration policies in order to keep talented individuals that go to these schools, they migrate to the United States, and actually, United States continues to serve as a magnet for world talent. So when people come there, they study there, they, they can continue to live there and contribute to the benefit of our society and our uh, national security if they choose so. Uh, so the talent piece really is a multi-layered uh, theme across all our recommendations because the people issue is really critical. If we succeed in competing more effectively with China is because of our people. Right now, our universities, our companies, and, and the number one reason why people want to migrate to the Western country is because we have opportunities for them to come and stay, get educated, and contribute to the benefit of our societies. And so we have to find ways to keep these talented individuals in our countries. The third bucket of recommendations really evolve around hardware. When we started the journey three years ago, a lot of our, a lot of our um, you know, engagements, people would push back and say, like, why are you guys focused on semiconductors? Well, the issue of semiconductors really now dominates almost every conversation and every front page of every newspaper. Uh, semiconductors, especially the high-end semiconductors, really enable that AI uh, application uh, development. And so when we talk about this, uh, there are pending legislations on the U.S. Congress uh, in order for United States to invest in domestic uh, uh, fab, fabs, as they call them, uh, for semiconductors. Uh, there are legislations here in European uh, Union now and the resources put towards that. Uh, Korea is also investing towards semiconductors. But really, uh, the supply chain issue of semiconductors is one of the critical issues we addressed in our final report and how we have to create so like an independent supply chain from China when it comes to these critical technologies. The last piece really is like, how do you spur that innovation ecosystem? What are the, the secret ingredients that all our societies have to put in place uh, in the triangle of innovation, as we call it in the United States, between private sector, academia, and government? And how you balance that triangle of innovation where academia uh, gets the necessary funding to continue doing basic R&D, where the government comes in with like focused and targeted investments, and where private sector really with their investments in R&D complements the, what's left to be done in our society. So how do you get that ecosystem really balanced really matters. Uh, from World War II until the end of the Cold War, United States government in United States was the leader in terms of innovation. That is no longer the case. Innovation is happening outside of government. It's happening outside of government labs. So how we create a new mechanisms where this triangle of innovation is a well-functioning uh, triangle for all our society. And then lastly, just two key themes. I'm sorry. Uh, but the one thing that really uh, took is constant throughout the report is the issue of values and norms. How we build these technologies, how we deploy them, and how we use them for economic, societal, and national security purposes should be based really on the values and norms and the rule of law that guide our democratic countries. And that is the constant theme in our final report. The last theme, and not uh, the last from the importance, but I believe it's the most important one, is the issue of partnerships. Allies and partners, and how we talk about them in our final report really matters. How we create democratic alliances around these technologies really matter. We really enjoyed having a good relationship with Dragos and his team because as we were developing uh, our final report, Dragos was helping us bring his insights from Brussels. Uh, and so I would finish there with, with saying that I think this is a really timely conference. I'm glad, uh, Dragos, you have organized it. And if there's anything we can do to share experiences from what we have done in the United States, we're more than welcome and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, Will. And, uh, and it's a very interesting report, actually, 700 pages. So, <laughs> so um, let me quickly move on to, uh, to the next speaker of today, uh, who is Tobias Westner, uh, as I said before, Head of Security and Law Program at the Geneva Center of Security Policy. Please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much welcome, for Rebecca. giving me the floor. And ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Dragos also, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you so much for, for, for this important uh, discussions and, and, and meetings. I'm going to build up on what has been said uh, previously. Um, so I think it's just about uh, right to highlight a couple of points. I think uh, what is obvious is that Europe, uh, until now, maybe it's going to change with the war uh, in Ukraine, but until now has really focused on, on the civilian applications um, of AI and not so much uh, on uh, the security uh, sector. This also, maybe we don't want to talk about it, but I think uh, has led to some uh, dependencies. On the one hand, a dependency on uh, the, the United States that is really continuing to lead uh, on uh, in regard of, of military applications of, of AI. On the other hand, also certain dependencies on a private organization, researchers, etc., that actually develop these tools for, for, as has been said, for civilian purposes and not uh, for, for military uh, purposes and, and defense uh, objectives. Thinking now in terms of the geopolitics of AI and the geopolitics political uh, competition, thinking maybe also in terms of AI race uh, between nations, between uh, value-based institutions, uh, between uh, maybe even, you can say, uh, AI arms races, because it's really about using uh, those AI uh, tools then, then for security purposes or, or for, 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 for weaponization. Um, I think here, also a point that I think is important is to recall that I would argue that it is different now AI, an AI arms race is different than what we have had or what we're used to normally with uh, arms races. I think with more traditional weapons, even very sophisticated ones like, like fighter jets, et cetera, et cetera, we kind of know what they're going to do. We kind of know how we're going to use them. And it's really about getting the best uh, equipment, the best tools, uh, and the most, and that will tilt the strategic balance. I would argue that right now, especially regard uh, in the phase that we're now with AI, the challenge, we're not there yet, that we just need the best and the, the most uh, uh, military equipment or tools. I think the challenge right now is really how can you really develop these, feel these, use this, and properly, properly use them in, in military uh, operations. And I would argue that those actors that are capable of doing that the quickest and the best will actually really have that strategic advantage in the geopolitical uh, competition that we're seeing. And this leads me to, to the strengths of, of the European Union, uh, namely the European Union uh, and Europe as normative powers. Now maybe with the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine, you're gonna say, oh no, let's stop with that daydreaming. Uh, it's not about norms anymore. It's really uh, about realpolitik. It's really about hard power. But I think that's why we really have to ask ourselves the questions. Well, actually, is this an asset, being a normative power, is it an asset to have standards, to have uh, norms, ethical principles, etc., or is this actually a disadvantage of our system of how we do things? And I, I think in particular this relates to the ethical principles uh, and standards that have been adopted so far, and, and we, we heard it, uh, the US has, has adopted ethical principles on the responsible use of AI. Um, NATO ha has recently adopted some. Uh, the EU has some uh, 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 guidelines, notably saying that uh, autonomous weapon systems without uh, proper or meaningful human controls are illegal, um, and, and a couple of states have that, uh, other, other states have that on a national basis. However, these standards, these, these rules and these principles remain fairly, fairly, fairly general. And that's kind of nice because especially diplomats know uh, constructive ambiguity uh, allows you to avoid certain hot topics. But the question then really right now in this geopolitical uh, competition is, well, if we develop more precise uh, principles, standards, etc., will that actually be beneficial uh, or not? And if you look at those uh, uh, principles that have been adopted so far, those guidelines uh, by the different nations, the, the, the issues that, that EU has already addressed, NATO, etc., I think you can easily come to the conclusion uh, or to the, to, to the insight that these standards actually help 
cutting, like getting ahead in this competition. And that for the simple reason, because what they, they do is they enable uh, to, to actually field uh, the AI tools and properly use them in, 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 in military operations. You can also turn the, the coin around and basically say, well, if other states, potential opponents, competitors do not do this, well, they will be at disadvantage actually because they don't have proper control over there. They cannot master uh, these AI tools and or even be vulnerable. So if you want to take a couple of illustrations, if you look at like safety uh, and reliability, you cannot have proper command and control and reach your military objectives if you don't if you cannot guarantee that with regard to AI. On the other hand, well, if your opponent doesn't have a safe and reliable system, you can easily manipulate them, uh, uh, hack them, or, 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 or influence them in a way that is your advantage. Same thing with responsibility or accountability. If you have that, only then you can ensure proper command and control. If your opponent or competitor does not have that, well, the state or the armed forces or whatever entity using those tools will have an organizational mess that normally you can try to, to, to exploit. And I think with regard to human control of, of issues there, maybe it's a bit trickier uh, because the question is really how far will the human factor slow certain, certain principles or, or create uh, room for, for, for errors. So it's really a, a, also especially a technical issue of how you can develop systems where you have a proper human control without uh, slowing the systems down or being at a disadvantage with regard to others. But I think the Russian forces right now in Ukraine show what happens when armed forces of, of, of not only the democratic states, but of other states too, when those armed forces do not have a confidence in their mission or in their equipment. So again, I think one, one element to consider. So going back then to, to what can be done, what could, should be done, I would argue uh, in that sense that really build try to build on this, these strengths as, as regulatory power, the EU as normative power, not in a typical sense of normative power internationally trying to influence the international standards, like at the group of governmental experts on lethal autonomous weapon systems in Geneva, but really setting the own standards, setting uh, the, the own record straight uh, uh, for having that uh, strategic uh, advantage, enabling uh, then and en ensuring uh, the researchers, academia, uh, the private sector, that their tools will be properly used eventually, thereby uh, encouraging uh, uh, their engagement in, in, in defense issues, which, which right now in Europe is not uh, necessarily uh, a given, but also through these standards enable uh, really sharing and working together, sharing these technologies, uh, enabling interoperability, and last but certainly not least, uh, uh, taking citizens' concerns regarding the military use of AI um, into to, to conservation. So in that sense, um, just to conclude, um, Really, uh, if we want to use AI uh, for uh, protecting democracy, for protecting the rule of law, I think that at the same time, uh, the EU and European states just show how actually democracy and the rule of law has certain advantages, even at the strategic level in this, the, this uh, uh, geopolitical uh, uh, field and, and competition. So thank you very much. Thank you, Torsten, and, uh, and um, I really like your point about ethical standards being a, a basis for spurring innovation and a strength in also of Europe in particular, and it, it goes naturally moving uh, to you. Um, Torsten Reil, you're the founder of a company uh, and, and CEO of a company called Helsing, uh, which exactly is working on military uh, AI or AI for defense and security uh, for democracies. Uh, very interested to hear more about that. That's right. Well, thank you. And uh, again, thank you for having me here. And um, I want to um, pick up on one of the themes that you just mentioned um, of arms races and, uh, and want to remind everyone that we are already in the middle of an arms race, a geopolitical arms race in AI, uh, which arguably started with, um, with big language models like GPT-3 that um, a lot of you will be aware of, um, which are big models. Um, in the case of GPT-3, 175 billion parameters uh, big neural networks that are able to ingest almost the entire internet and from there are able to um, uh, produce uh, texts, um, program computers and do a whole bunch of different other things. And it's becoming obvious that these kinds of networks are going to be extremely important. Um, 
partially also because of their potential to automate jobs um, and to do whole, a whole bunch of other things, possibly also as the basis for artificial general intelligence. And there is already a worldwide arms race going on in that area. Uh, just recently, a few days ago, China announced that they had uh, essentially a, um, a new version of this approach of GPT-3, which now has one trillion parameters. And they think that the approach that they're taking will scale up to almost 200 trillion parameters. Now, the size of the network doesn't exactly predict what the um, power is going to be, but it's highly correlated. Um, and the worrying thing about all of this is, is that um, the costs involved in all of this are so high that only really big technology companies can afford them or state actors. And we have to decide as the European Union um, and as Europeans, where are we in all of this? Where are we in this arms race? Because currently we're not, we're not really competing in that. So... AGI, artificial general intelligence, is a big um, topic, I think, for the future. Th there are much closer topics, and specifically around AI for defense. And there we have a situation in Europe where, well, first of all, in general, um, defense um, is becoming more and more a software and AI problem. It's moving away from hardware, which kind of was the 20th century way of doing things, much more towards software and AI. And the reason is that AI is so powerful at um, ingesting a huge amount of unstructured information and make sense of it and actually aid humans in decision making. So there is this big push towards using software and AI in defense. The problem that we have is that the companies that are the existing companies and the historically big companies in the space, they're not set up to be software companies. They are set up to be hardware companies. And that is not dissimilar to what's been happening in the automotive industry, where you have a number of companies that have been struggling to develop autonomous driving. A similar situation is now happening in the defense space. And this is a problem that we have to solve. Um, there are already companies in the US, new technology companies that are trying to solve this problem, are trying to um, approach things differently, and that specifically means software first. But we have to be honest to ourselves that in Europe we have nothing, basically. And that is why we started our company, um, Helsing, with just over 100 people now. We started over just over a year ago, uh, raised um, just over 100 million uh, euros in, in funding. And the idea behind this company is that we need these kinds of capabilities, software and AI, in Europe to stay sovereign and to be able to um, have a foundation that we determine what it is in terms of the ethics foundation, in terms of how the technology is being used. That's why we're building this. And It'll be an interesting discussion later on, you'll to talk about what does it take to create an ecosystem of these kinds of companies. Um, I think there's actually a very simple solution, but we can talk about that later. Um, but there's a third thing I want to talk about um, briefly, which is the less sexy part of AI, which is common AI infrastructure. One of the things that we're missing and that almost no one is working on is the plumbing of AI, all the underlying um, infrastructure, infrastructure that is required to um, look at data security, data provenance, that means where does data actually come from, uh, its um, scalability, its transparency, accountability, it's the deployment of neural networks, the easy deployment, it's the versioning of neural networks. And again, this is not the most exciting thing, but without that, nothing will work. And without that, we won't have interoperability either. And so Interoperability um, across um, nations in the EU, as well as um, across the EU and NATO, I think is going to be one of the major themes. We mentioned it earlier. Um, and we need to have a software and AI infrastructure to make this work. No one's working on this yet. This is a big, big um, gap right now. And one of the suggestions could be that, um, for example, um, someone like the EDF actually funds this as a program and makes this something that becomes a thing in Europe and uh, across Europe and, and, and possibly NATO as well. So. A lot of work to do. Um, it is obviously a very vibrant um, uh, space that is moving very quickly. Um, but I'm glad to be here and I'm um, looking forward to the conversation. And um, I'm also very curious about the regulatory framework and how you know you ensure that the things that you're making are actually used in the right context and by the right powers. But let me uh, pass on the word now to uh, our host of today, uh, uh, Dragos Tudorace, for comments and probably also some questions for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gri, and, and many thanks to all three of our panelists. Uh, very interesting contributions already. Yes, I'll <coughs> abuse my uh, rights as a host to, to, to be the first to shoot some questions to you. Um, already interesting uh, the things you've said. I'll start maybe with, with Torsten. 
you ask some very interesting questions yourselves about how do we uh, guarantee the plumbing of AI, as you very nicely called it. I actually remember this phrase <laughs> and use it myself. Um, my question to you as someone who already started creating, uh, you're an innovator yourself, you started creating basically business out of this. Um, so my question is, what do you think the public sector, us <clears throat> as, as regulators or politicians, should actually do more Understanding that at the European level, because this is defense, there's not a lot that could be done because of the competence issue, even if we look at the AI Act and the standards that we're working on, defense is already carved out of that. But still, uh, I'm sure that you have been thinking, you have been lacking things, some of them you mentioned. So is there a role for governments, is there a role for the public sector at national and EU level? And again, I'll be very happy to hear your thoughts on that. And also, I have a question um, about the nitty-gritty in a way, uh, and the commonalities in the design of algorithms that are used for civilian purposes that might also be useful for defense purposes. <clears throat> and thinking also of the fact that we are going to have rules very soon uh, in place, at least I hope, uh, as co-rapporteur, we're going to have rules in place very soon for the civilian part of AI, and how you could actually develop these algorithms. If I'm a company, that designs algorithms, so I'll have one end, one outcome of an algorithm that might be regulated because it's for civilian purposes and then possibly maybe the same design, the same algorithm, but if I give it another objective, could be used for, for defense purposes. So again, is it something that you, uh, in the business end, you, you're playing with as an idea and, and what are your thoughts on that? And moving on to, to Tobias, um, a question on standards, uh, and you've mentioned yourself, and hearing also uh, Deputy Secretary General Joanna earlier, we have this newfound energy now, where, uh, of course, we have uh, security cooperation, common interests, uh, motivated by, by the war in Ukraine, if not for, for anything else before. Uh, but in this quest for emerging technologies that we have, we might also might be tempted to cut some corners. How do we balance how do we balance the, the possible democratic deficit? How do we balance the, the need to still preserve the values while we are pursuing this sort of um, race? I've heard also the word arm race being mentioned. Um, and also, again, in the design of standards, because as I was saying earlier, yes, in the civilian area, we are going to have soon standards, but in the defense area, as you said, we might have some very loose Gen generic principles uh, outlined, but, but not more than that. And last, but certainly not least to you, Ili, a question on China. Um, you've mentioned China, and I know also from the discussions that we've had in, in Washington when we visited with AIDA officially uh, Washington, and the buzz was China. So from Monday to Friday, in almost every conversation that we've had, uh, in Congress, in the White House, uh, with the think tanks. China was the centerpiece. And you said it yourself, in fact, the work that you've done, and as far as I understand, the work that you still do right now with the Special Projects team, is actually to look at China, to look at the 10 technologies that uh, President Xi has put forward out there and find a way to balance out this quest for supremacy. So my question is, what do you think China has right now uh, you mentioned talent as one of the leveraging elements, but do you think China has right now that actually gives them an edge and where we need to compensate or invest or, 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 or put some effort into? Thank you. Do you want me to start? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, to, to your point about what, what can government um, do at, at the various levels, I, mean, I guess the first point I want to make is that it starts with us, not necessarily with government, and, and I believe that we all have agency, and then we cannot actually move a lot of things ourselves, first of all, without any initial government help. And this is the reason why we started this company as well, without government help. Uh, we can actually do a lot, and I actually also think that we have a responsibility and we have a duty um, to build technology that makes um, liberal democracies and, and European democracies in particular sovereign. And, and in terms of your question, um, you know, what, what gives us an advantage over China? That is a real advantage. This feeling of agency, this feeling of actually being able to do something in the system, not having to ask for permission. China has 
the advantage of um, civil military fusion. Um, the Chinese government can uh, uh, strongly encourage um, companies um, in the civilian space to work in the military. We don't have that, and hopefully we never will. But we have this advantage of citizens feeling agency and, um, and hopefully um, you know, supporting the cause of liberal democracies. That's my first point. The, the, the other one about what can governments do at the... At the European level, as I was mentioning, I think guidance as to what is required in terms of a common AI infrastructure is going to be really important. Again, no one is really addressing that right now. So guidance on the one hand, um, what does that entail? And it doesn't need to be extremely specific specifications. It needs to be general guidance. What do we want to achieve, for example, in terms of interoperability? And then secondly, providing the funding for companies, and that should be technology companies, to actually start working on this and work on this in an iterative way rather than uh, a large monolith um, software project, start finding solutions that work quickly across a number of areas. The other big part of how governments um, can help, and this is a crucial thing I alluded to earlier, is access to large programs for new defense companies. This is the one thing that will make a difference. Um, innovators, um, innovation labs and incubators and innovation grants um, and funds can help, but they won't ultimately make all the difference. They can catalyze at the beginning, but they can't really allow a company to become a successful commercial company. For that, new defense companies need access to large programs. And obviously that access has to happen at, um, at the national government level. Um, and in fact, what we believe is that um, new programs now need to have or give work share of 20% to new defense companies. Um, that is required for these companies to be successful, to have revenues that they can predict, and also um, eventually for these companies, new defense companies, to be attractive to private money like VC companies. Um, that's the big, big thing that will make a difference. Um, finally, the, the topic of um, civilian algorithms and um, defense algorithms and, and the similarity, that's a huge topic in its own right. W one thing I think that is worth talking about is a concept that we call military-grade AI. AI in the defense space is, is actually quite different in terms of its um, requirements to the civilian space. And just one example, uh, data is one. In the civilian space, you tend to have a huge amount of data. In the defense space, you don't. Sometimes you have, for a new category um, of an object that needs to be recognized, just two or three examples. So data scarcity is a huge issue. That means you have to develop algorithms that can not just deal with data scarcity, but actually embrace it and become very powerful by very quickly learning from very few data points. It's quite different from the civilian space. And then maybe one final thought on this. In the defense space, even more than in, in the civilian space, it's important to understand what the AI is doing. Um, we call this um, viewing the world through the lens of an AI. That means that we give already th with our tools human operators an intuitive feeling for why an AI is making decisions or recommendations the way it does. That's different from uh, assigning probabilities to a particular object. It's actually something that needs to be much more intuitive and eventually is required also for transparency and accountability, more so in defense even than in the civilian space. Just want to give everyone a chance to respond. So, uh, who wants to go first? Please. Well, thank you very much for a re really tough question uh, to, to how to not cut corners, especially under this pressure of, a, of an AI race or AI arms race and, and certain uh, other states, etc., that, that have maybe uh, their uh, comparative advantage in terms of uh, procedures and, and accountability uh, towards their, their citizens. I think it's a really tough question. I'm, 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 I'm not in Brussels, so, so I know the dynamics of, of Geneva, but not that well Brussels. I think absolutely necessary is definitely uh, the, the whole transparency uh, a factor in a sense that if these technologies are, are so rapidly evolving, if the use, the, 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 the use cases are rapidly uh, evolving, uh, also the, the regulations, et cetera, or, 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 or the policies to really inform uh, uh, quite, quite, quite uh, well and, and, and always a jour and, and not like do something what sometimes you see like all three years you get a report and then you're like, wow, that was a milestone. But really having that uh, transparency that really uh, that can be followed. I think something, another um, that, that, that Torsten has mentioned or, or related to what he has mentioned, um, I'm, I'm coming from the, from, from, the, from the legal perspective. So oftentimes uh, lawyers and definitely international lawyers take a very doctrinal uh, top-down view on, on, on issues. I think maybe here is something that, that is also uh, important to, to not cut corners is, you know, 
know, really look at the results and really look at, at, at the effects of, of, of certain uh, uh, systems, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing is, is the process and, and, and what is being done, but really trying to show uh, uh, what these systems can do. And by that also, uh, relating it to, 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 to verification and to, to certain testing, uh, et cetera, that can really, uh, uh, again, explain uh, that. On, on the, the, the EU guidelines on, on military AI, et cetera, the, these principles that re remain vague, I think that's definitely a, a starting point uh, for the EU, for European states. Uh, the Geneva Center for Security Policy is, is launching a, a, a multi-stakeholder interdisciplinary uh, a process that tries to exactly address those issues and really from a, from, from, from a, from a broad perspective, uh, not only a, a public or government-led, uh, so maybe that uh, those results can also serve as interpretive guides. Uh, so like a typical uh, legal doctrine, et cetera, where you can refer to and, and, and see uh, what others uh, uh, have said or how things could be viewed, uh, et cetera. And then uh, NATO uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, has mentioned that NATO has adopted uh, these these uh, principles on the ethical, on the responsible use of AI uh, is working on the clarification uh, uh, on, on those issues and how, how to, to, to operationalize. And I, I'm not an expert in NATO-EU uh, uh, relations, but, but I think it's definitely uh, uh, a good thing to, to influence that, that process and value uh, the output uh, of that process. Nice working. George, thanks. Uh, great question. So um, I think you're right in your observation that China really dominates the conversations in Washington. Uh, I would argue that there's a bipartisan consensus in terms of uh, uh, the, the state of the competition against two rivals, namely Russia and China. And while I understand Russia is the topic of the day and primarily here in Europe, I think given the size of the economy, given the investments that China is making in terms of uh, their capabilities uh, and their military services, I think China will remain a, a long-term challenge uh, in the eyes of the Washington select so national security institutions. Uh, so with that, I'll just, uh, to, be, to go back to your question about what China is doing and where they are right now, um, it's no secret that China has uh, ambitions uh, to dominate these 10 technologies I think you mentioned earlier, and the list is public of the technologies they would, they, they wanna, they're investing, they have a strategy, and they're putting enormous resources to actually uh, get ahead. Um, I think right now when you look at that list, uh, I would argue that in terms of 5G, I think we all here know that they've done a lot of inroads, uh, not just here in Europe, but uh, around the world, uh, because of their civil mill fusion and the way they uh, subsidize their domestic companies, Huawei, I think they were able to really get, get ahead of democratic countries in terms of deploying the digital infrastructure globally. Um, the second piece I would argue that they are really probably getting ahead is in terms of the hypersonics. Uh, so when you look at down that list, the one thing that I would really just take a step back and focus on a 30,000 feet uh, view here is that we're talking about AI, but when you look at all these uh, technologies that will have so, so many uh, implications for economies and our societies and ultimately national securities, we have to take a holistic approach to how we as democratic nations uh, invest and use these technologies and not just focus on one specific technology and see how we can regulate that one in particular and come up from a really risk-averse uh, perspective. But all these technologies, um, when you look at, you talked about dependencies, I would argue that there were, a lot of, uh, there were many people that really ignored the, the issue of uh, gas dependency here in Europe from Russia. And I think now the conflict in Ukraine has really served as a wake-up call of like how to break these dependencies from authoritarian regimes. If today's issue of dependency on gas is focused around Russia, I would really like to avoid any potential future scenario in which we wake up and we have a digital dependency on China where they have laid out the global digital infrastructure in the 5G antennas, they're dominated by Beijing, they have dominating the software or the virtual uh, 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 the world. And so it would be a completely different scenario, unlike the one we're facing now with Russia, in any kind of uh, potential you know, uh, conflict-related scenarios we will have with China, because even though China is not geographically close to Europe, the digital dependency will cost both Europe and United States, um, really, really too much uh, 
if we go but if we go down the path of like relying on the technologies built by Beijing. So what we can do, you ask Dragos, I think three quick points. One is we have to get our democracies organized around this technology-enabled future. What does that mean? I think what Tobias and Torsten talked about, like building these technologies based on our norms and values and really providing an alternative uh, form of these technologies to the world, to the African countries, uh, countries in Latin America, an alternative version of what China is doing right now because the, the rest of the world knows that if we deploy these technologies based on the rule of law built here in Brussels or in Washington, then there's a different way where citizens can comply, they can address criticism, and actually not even decide, and decide not to use these technologies. So that's the one thing, is how we can organize a vision around these technologies. The second piece that I would argue is, how can we build what I call it a democracy list of technologies? If China has the list of nine technologies that they want to dominate, I believe the democratic countries around the world can build the democratic list. I think in Europe is always going to be ahead in some aspects of these technologies, for example, in bio and some other places. Uh, Japan and Korea will provide comparative advantages in other technologies. United States will invest in technologies. But jointly, the tech alliance of democracies will create a list of all these technologies that will be so beneficial by the end of this decade. I mean, uh, Secretary Deputy Secretary General of NATO mentioned quantum. Quantum is one of these areas that we have to stay ahead in. So who is investing where and who is actually, uh, uh, you know, staying ahead really matters for how that technology is going to evolve. And then the last piece is really we have to come up with a new model to, to bring together public and private sector. I know there's been a lot of antagonistic relationship in the recent years between the two communities, but I think we will never have a civil fusion version of, a, uh, of what China has in how they utilize that relationship. I think we have to come up with a new mechanism and new forums in how you bring these companies under your tent or under our democratic tent because the, for two reasons. Number one is we saw the role they played in the current Ukrainian crisis. Uh, I think the way we organize relief efforts, the way people connect to each other, how these platforms were used uh, to block disinformation campaigns, I think matters. And I think this is the first instance in which I think we can open up those dialogues with these, uh, with these companies. And the second piece is, as we regulate these technologies, uh, it's like, as I mentioned earlier, innovation is happening outside of government. You cannot innovate something, you cannot regulate something you don't understand. So having these dialogues in which, you know, you get uh, to understand the implications and the importance of these technologies and the standards and the norms they have to, to carry on, I think it will matter in how we build this relationship going forward. Okay, thank you. So, so we've been talking a little bit about global rules under attack, as, as uh, the Nature Deputy Secretary was saying. And, and, um, and also, you know, using AI in defense and attack. And, and I want to pull this uh, conversation maybe to the European reality. So if we talk about uh, the AI Act, for example, the, the, the regulation doesn't, or at least the proposal doesn't apply to AI systems that are developed for military purposes exclusively. But then if we think of AI as a dual-use technology that can be used both for civil um, uh, civilian and military purposes, then we have a different kind of uh, context to talk about. And actually, I want to go back to you, <laughs> to Raji, to just to, to see what, in terms of the regulatory framework, again, what do you think? I saw you were also scribbling, so you might have some other uh, ideas that you would like to, to, to say here at the end. Well, I, I don't want to take the floor of these guys, but uh, um, I'm scribbling away because I'm, I'm picking up a lot of ideas, and I think one of them is going to be interoperability. And I think we, we, we need to start, uh, I, I know we've heard uh, the, the Deputy Secretary General already speak of that, speak of Diana. I'm looking forward to, to exactly see how Diana will shape up, because I do think that we need a common space. Um, we need to start thinking how we create that common space where we discuss interoperability not only between what the US and what the EU is doing in terms of military capabilities and investments in defense, particularly in cutting edge technologies in defense, and again, I hear you fully agree with Thorsten, I think the weapons of tomorrow are going to be, just, as, just like the cars of tomorrow, the value of them is going to be much more the software that is embedded in them rather than the iron and the quality of the engine. I think the same thing for the weapon systems of tomorrow. It is going to be very much about the capability of the softwares 
and of the AI that is going to be embedded in those systems rather than the system itself and the iron behind it. But therein lies the question of interoperability and how do we invest in that on both sides of the Atlantic to make sure that we actually arrive at, at common goals. And when speaking of interoperability, also the, the, the issue of dual use, and uh, that's why I also asked my question about how this sort of uh, commonality in, in, in the design, in, in thinking of this algorithm, how is that going to play out in, in terms of military investments? Yeah, and then, uh, then I think also another thing that we should uh, probably also really address now is this kind of current reality that we're in right now. And, and one thing that I, I always uh, think about is, is this idea now when we're talking about military application, we're talking about uh, uh, AI that can improve our defense capability as military capabilities. But um, in this situation that we're in right now, are there, um, are there compromises that we're accepting that, uh, that we'll have to live with tomorrow? We have to think about these. And, and, and what are we legitimizing uh, in terms of when in, in our this, uh, this very moment where we are thinking more um, effectively and more nuanced about uh, a current crisis where you can have applications of AI that in one situation, in a peace situation, will be used. We see that, for example, in a facial recognition technology that's been used and been very controversial in a peace situation, and then applied, for example, in, in Ukraine uh, on, uh, for other purposes and gets a different definition. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I can see, Torsten, you are, are nodding. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I mean, it's a difficult topic in general because it's, it's, it's very complex. Um, I, I would say in general that the, the main thing we need to do is to provide um, people with tools so that the AI and the applications understood in the first place. That is actually sorely lacking already to be honest. I mean, we already know that things like biases, even facial recognition, job applications, a whole bunch of other things are already happening, and we don't know exactly why. So more than anything else, I think we need to provide that layer of tools and of, of AI infrastructure for this to become actually inspectable in the first place. Thank you. Okay, uh, yes, and I was wondering if the last two speakers would like to, because we're moving towards the break now, and if you have any comments on my question or any of the other topics you would like to conclude with, then uh, please, I want to give you the last, a last chance to, to, uh, to speak up now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, what you mentioned with the democratic uh, tech agenda, but also really what you said with uh, considering AI as dual use, or at least this, this potential uh, to be a dual use item, something that hasn't been mentioned yet, and I think also is not that much on, on the, the agenda in general, uh, I think is also the question of export controls. And, and how do we want to deal with that in a sense? One is the, the competition uh, between the, 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 the competitors, the, the actors, but the other thing is also if we manage to develop these technologies, how do we prevent the spread? And, and thinking of the Cold War, there was a committee, uh, the Coordination Committee, um, that, that, that really tries to, 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 to uh, uh, an export control regime that tried to unite the states uh, uh, to control their, their strategic items to prevent them from, from going to, to, to the Warsaw Pact. Uh, the successor uh, institution is the Westenauer arrangement. Russia is part there. Uh, it's blocked since a couple of years anyway, so probably not a very, very effective tool. But I think uh, also in that sense, maybe in terms of uh, thinking of, of how, how, how this aspect uh, can, can, can be approached. Thank you. And then, Bill, you have exactly one minute, and then we yeah. have our uh, very short break yeah. afterwards. I uh, don't want to steal time Thank from you. Thank you again. Uh, just, I wanted to end on a positive note that I think every time we talk about AI, uh, people usually really jump right away into some uh, negative scenarios, uh, either Skynet, Terminator uh, scenarios. I think uh, AI p p provides a huge potential, and I think we have to embrace as democratic nations the potential that it will be for our healthcare. For, for the, you know, addressing climate uh, related issues and for the future of education. So I think as much as we talk about the risk associated with AI, there are huge opportunities with this technology. And so I think we just have to find the right balance between innovation and regulation and do it together in a manner that we stay ahead. And as I said it many, many times, we base these technologies on our values and norms. So with that, Gree, thank you and Dragos for having me. Uh, and thanks everybody. Thank you, and I'm sorry, I have to be strict with time because otherwise I'm stealing time of the uh, break that we're having now. We have exactly 15 minutes. 
You have to be back here at 4 p.m. sharp in your seats uh, because we will have our keynote of the uh, starting the sec second, sec sec second section. Thank you.
with a mic. So. Okay, so we uh, have a few minutes left before the end of the break, and I will ask anyone who's here and also anyone outside that can hear me to please come and sit down. Bring your coffees and teas and water, but uh, please be ready for four o'clock. Okay, there's one minute before we start again, so please take your seats. One minute. Please, uh, we're starting in very little time. Please sit down. Okay, please sit down, everyone. We are ready for our first keynote of the second half. Hello. Sorry to be oops, so, sorry to be exercising so tough discipline on you, uh, but I will remind you that we have a more ample room for networking and socializing uh, after 5.30, so that is why we had to keep this break very short. And now we are gliding smoothly, I hope, 
from uh, the topic of, of security and the geopolitics of AI. I'm hoping you have enjoyed the conversations here on stage. We are gliding smoothly towards the second and certainly as important or maybe even more important one would argue, uh, which is democracy and the impact that artificial intelligence, new technologies are having on how our democracies function. And I cannot think of anyone better to introduce this topic, uh, to have a keynote on this than our Vice President of European Commission, Vera Jourova. Unfortunately, she could not be physically with us because of the same classical COVID, but we still very much appreciate and I very much want to thank you, uh, dear Vera, for, for uh, making the time to be with us online. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon, dear Drahosh, dear colleagues, dear friends. I'm happy to be with you. I am very unhappy not to be with you in person, and especially because of the program which follows after 5.30, <laughs> which uh, uh, was a really uh, tempting promise of meeting people and having some food and drink for free. Uh, I, I'm really unhappy I cannot, I cannot be there, but uh, uh, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, the, the topic of AI is, is extremely important because we are now in a turning point uh, in, in Europe because there is a growing consensus in the democratic part of the world, including Europe, that artificial intelligence not only brings huge benefits uh, to our economies and societies, uh, but also creates risks that need to be carefully addressed. Uh, the opacity of uh, algorithms can create uncertainty and hinder the application of fundamental rights or create or recreate bias. I always say that uh, we have to teach uh, AI, we have to teach uh, algorithms uh, not to see the imperfections of real world copy pasted on, on, uh, in, in AI sphere, uh, which uh, would definitely turn against the people. We want AI to serve the people in, in the best way. <clears throat> and we are aware that artificial intelligence will make decisions for us, which requires supervision and transparency. It must not become uncontrollable power, something like black box or uh, maybe other metaphor to, to, to let the tiger get out of the cage. There must be always a human being, uh, uh, somebody who will be able to control how the algorithms are designed, how they work, and uh, whether they do not turn against the interest of, of the people themselves. The same algorithms can be used to distinguish pears from apples, but also Uyghur from the other ethnicity. Uh, they can be used to improve security or introduce mass surveillance uh, or social scoring. So the rules we forge today as EU policymakers will hopefully help us make AI a positive force for building stronger and, and, uh, and better Europe. And we need to prevent public and private actors from misusing this powerful technology to undermine our democratic values and collective security. Europe has come up with a two-pronged strategy. First, to promote excellence in order for Europe to become a world leader. So the effort to harmonize AI research across Europe and increase investments. And the goal is 20 billion euro per year. It must be understood as 20 billion euro, which should be a combination of public and private money. And the second pillar is to create uh, what we call an ecosystem of trust so that AI does not unduly affect our fundamental rights, such as privacy or non-discrimination or jeopardize our security. <clears throat> In this context, almost a year ago, on the 21st of April last year, the Commission presented a package on artificial intelligence. And the aim of the package uh, is and was simple. This technology should benefit the citizens, not turn them into just data donors. 
we all want Europe to become a leader in AI, but it is true that today a substantial part of the AI solutions are developed outside the union. This is why we need to ensure that if they offer their services in the EU, they need to respect our laws. The new rules for AI are, in my view, a proportionate and risk-based following the simple logic. The higher the risk, the stricter the rules. First, we propose to prohibit certain AI practices that clearly contravene EU democratic values and fundamental rights. In particular, we are talking here about social scoring by governments that may lead to exclusion and discrimination of people. A major concern is also the growing potential for AI-powered mass surveillance. In this respect, we propose to explicitly prohibit the use of real-time remote biometric identification systems for law enforcement purposes in publicly accessible spaces with some limited exceptions and subject to strong safeguards. One of the exceptions is, for instance, uh, uh, when a missing uh, children is, is uh, uh, at stake or, or some uh, immediate danger uh, stemming from, from the preparation of some, I don't know, terrorist attack or th this, this kind of situations. But, but really the exceptions are very limited. And as a principle, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, powered mass surveillance is prohibited and will be prohibited uh, in, in the European space. We have also identified a limited number of clearly defined AI systems that pose high risks to safety and fundamental rights, for instance, in recru uh, recruitment or in justice. Those high risk AI systems will have to conform to specific requirements like data quality, human oversight, as well as robustness, accuracy and security and will be monitored for compliance with existing rule of law and fundamental rights requirements. And finally, regardless of whether AI is classified as high risk or not, minimum transparency is required towards affected people. So they are always informed when inter interacting with a machine or exposed to a deep fake an emotion recognition or a biometric categorization system. Such transparency aims to empower people to make informed decisions, step back from harmful interactions and assert their rights under existing fundamental rights legislation. There are challenges regarding elections and political advertising. Here comes the connection of AI democracy connection or clash, if you, if you like, it, is, it might be both. Uh, AI can be very relevant in the context of our elections. Opaque automated systems may engage people in targeted political communication or advertising and try to distort the outcome of our political processes. We need to anticipate and prevent this. We get glimpse to this dark world mainly through scandals or journalistic investigations, such as now in famous uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal. I always say that the political campaign must be the competition, fair competition of uh, ideas, uh, of visions, uh, uh, and not the competition of who can use a more dirty method. It should be the competition of real people uh, among real people and not uh, and allowing the artificial intelligence to, to enter in that uh, game or, or, or campaigning. Uh, so because we have identified a lot of risks from, from this angle, uh, we have put forward a proposal on political advertising in November last year. Once adopted, this initiative will improve transparency in paid political ads and deal specifically with the risks or of targeted political advertising. It will help us ensure that new technologies are tools for emancipation of voters, not manipulation of elections. The new law will also clarify the obligations of online platforms. 
And let me be clear here, we don't want to interfere with the content, but with the amplification methods. Simply with AI, some systems are complex and opaque that even for the companies that deploy them, it is difficult to understand how they work. And we can already see that there is a potential for replicating or amplifying existing bias. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, the Commission is taking action, having in mind the need to preserve our democratic values, collective security, and the rights of our citizens. Democracy must survive, uh, and technologies should help, but uh, not the contrary. What goes through the red thread uh, of these proposals, uh, uh, which I tried to describe in short, is the focus on the human being to have free choice and confidence in the digital age that the technologies will serve them. I wish you a good debate today, and I want to thank Mr. Tururace for organizing this event once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to invite the panelists for our second panel today on democracy uh, and AI in Europe. Uh, and uh, while I invite you, I also want to introduce um, our keynote of, of this panel, uh, the Dutch Minister for Digitalization, Government of the Netherlands, Mrs. Alexandra van Hoeflen, the first Dutch uh, minister with a ministerial post dealing with digitalization, in fact. Please. Thank you. So I'm going to stand in Long enough to stand behind this desk, so I'm actually standing on something that's going to be very wobbly. Um, so if I somehow collapse, do you know I'm laying there somewhere um, on the floor? But um, thank you very much, Dragos, for, for having uh, me in this platform with all these excellent speakers that have already been here before me and the super critical panel that's going to... Well, I don't know, criticize me, I think, afterwards. I hope you will, uh, because of this topic, of course, that is very important. And thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Um, as I prepared for today, uh, my mind went actually back to the past two years when I served not as a Minister for Digitalization, but I was working within the Ministry of Finance in the Netherlands on uh, benefits and customs. And in this role, I was responsible for helping to solve the so-called childcare benefits scandal. I don't know if you have read Politi Politico today, but they were writing about this issue. More than 25,000 people were wrongly accused of making fraudulent benefit claims. Many of them ended up in deep poverty because, um, <clears throat> the, uh, because of the thousands of euros they were obliged to, to pay back to the tax office. And every week I sat with 10 people of them, just one by one, and those meetings were deeply touching because the lives of these people were devastated. Imagine losing your job, your health, your home, your marriage, or even your ch children being placed into child custody. And all of this because of a combination of errors of judgment in your government. And yes, AI played a very important part in that combination. So when I think of AI and democracy, as we're going to talk about today, the faces and voices of these people, mainly mothers, were immediately coming to mind. These people, to these people, their government was not trustworthy and their democratic rights were trampled with immense effects. On a broader note, of course, we see AI becoming an increasing factor in the information that we see and that we spread. And there can be a great danger in this as well, a risk of filter bubbles, polarization, radicalization even, and democracy in open debates should always be safeguarded online. You should get a variety 
and a broad range of information so you can form your opinion freely. The digital age offers many opportunities to strengthen the democracy, to enable people to express themselves and to be included in a democratic process. But this is not going to happen automatically. Human-centric IA is not a given. The development and application of IA is never value-free. On a state level, we see AI being used effectively in information warfare. On a business level, we see it companies using hiring people, for instance, only to find out later that it discriminated against women and recommended unqualified people. Consumer behavior can be manipulated by AI in ways that are detrimental to them. We must be very realistic about the downsides of digitalization and make sure that the digital transition is going to be human-centric always, as also stated by Mrs. Jourova, and of course based on democratic values and rights. And we must take a good look at the effects of AI on our democratic processes, the free flow of information, safe public spaces, a public discourse that is inclusive and based on facts, and a balance of power in the digital market. All these principles should be upheld online just as they are offline. And I truly believe that the best place to start is here in Europe, within the European Union, as an economic and democratic community, but also in a broader community of the Council of Europe. Together we should set the worldwide standard for online protection of democracy, human rights and the rule of law. And to do this, of course, we need transparency, effective control of the use of AI, and we must ensure that our citizens have somewhere to go if, theme, if things seem to go wrong. And that's why I see pra three practical ways to get there. First of all, let us quickly proceed with the legislative packages that are presented by the European Commission. It contains very powerful tools to address disinformation, the imbalance of power, and make sure that AI systems are being developed in a fair and transparent way. But I also believe that it should be improved, especially with the Dutch childcare benefits scandal in mind. In the end, it was the sum of four of the factors that led to so much harm. Discriminating assumptions, firstly, which were used as an input for the tax office risk assessment. Secondly, an algorithm that turned out to be biased, especially discriminating against women and people with an immigration background. Thirdly, because there was no real human oversight afterwards. And fourthly, people who protested against the judgment basically weren't heard. Even the highest courts in the Netherlands found them wrong. So in short, AI worked as an amplifier. It was part of the problem, not the only factor. And for me, these lessons should be reflected in the legislation that we are making to make sure that we have solid guarantees for human rights. So first of all, certification is crucial. Of course, all the high-risk AI systems should be certified be before they are being put into use. But personally, however, I would like to see it more, more AI systems to be certified in order to protect citizens and mainly also children. Second, I believe that impact assessments should be meaningful and address fundamental rights in the complete AI life cycle. The AI, the AI Act asks developers to assess certain risks and privacy legislation ask deployers to assess privacy risks in particular. But is this enough? I do not believe so. I think we should ask, also ask the users of high risk to should be obliged, obliged to do these checks. But also I believe that we should look broader. And in the Netherlands, for instance, we developed a, an impact assessment tool for human rights. And I believe that that should be implemented as well. Thirdly, natural persons and their rights should, be, should play a bigger role across the board. Those impacted by AI systems need clear information about the systems that are used by governments especially. In line with this, I would like to see a legal right of complaint for citizens and consumers. 
either in the AI Act or in a, another way to make sure that people have a place to go when they think, that when they believe things are going wrong. The fourth and final thing that I would like to add, add would be that human-centric AI requires more, not just to protect people by demanding more transparency, transparency or making sure that they have somewhere to go, but also in the way that these systems are being used because there should always be meaningful human intervention, especially when systems have a big influence on people's lives. I believe these four factors will strengthen the quality of the legislation and its enforcement, both on the uh, uh, EU level and also in the member states. We have already taken in the Netherlands two extra steps, um, which is the uh, establishing of a so-called algorithm watchdog, and we're expanding the the budget of the Dutch Data Protection Authority. The second thing that we believe, I think we believe to do is make sure that we ask big tech companies to take more responsibility for their products and platforms. Polarizing um, algorithms are not okay. They need to be more open and we need to have more access to data for independent research and supervision. Recommender systems and other systemic risks such as deep fake need to be Defects need to be more managed, need to be managed more uh, and better by the platforms. And we are already taking a step ahead with the Digital Services Act, and of course also in the AI Act. But I truly believe also for the short term this needs to be more embedded in the new code of pra practice. And I call upon all the signatories of the code to include commitments on com recommender systems and labeling of content um, in the code of practice. And also, besides this, I believe we need to make sure that there are more safe and viable alternatives to what we are using. So privacy-friendly messaging apps like Signal or in the Netherlands, um, a, we have created a, or not we have, but there's a group of people that have created public spaces which aims to reclaim the online domain from the dominance of the big tech platforms. The third point I wanted to make and, and uh, is about governments and how they need to lead by example, by strengthening the trust in democracies. What we have learned in the Netherlands with this child care benefits case is that strong legislation and enforcement is needed. Legislation and enforcement. With, of course, clear prohibitions and duties applied in every government level and held by practical instruments. An example if these instruments, of one of these instruments is this impact tool on human rights and algorithms, which I mentioned before. But there are other guidelines that we're using for non-discrimination by design, and that also helps us to minimize the risks of discrimination. Ladies and gentlemen, the most valuable lesson of the child care benefit scandal has told me that digital technology should always serve for people instead of the other way around. In the end, it's about people and their fundamental rights. And I believe we can put AI to a good use and serving our citizens by applying it to, an important, to important social issues like health or climate change. Severe diseases can more easily be diagnosed, for instance, with apps like Skin Vision, and governments can offer their citizens better and more transparent services, helping or using AI. But the digital world will only thrive if people are protected online just as they are offline. And if the democracy and the rule of law are being upheld in the digital world as well in the physical world. And I am deeply motivated and want to make sure that people stay at the heart of what we're doing, of everything AI. Because it's the only way to maintain trust in technology and our democracy. And let us work together to get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Van Hoevelen. And um, let's start uh, right off with the panel here. I have uh, a panel of uh, some very interesting and distinguished people. Kathleen Shea, member of the European Parliament, the Vice President from Renew Europe. Uh, Richard Young, Senior Associate Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, next to me. And then Natalie Smuha, 
From the Faculty of Law, uh, Kerry Leon, and also the backbone of the AI high-level group, I would say. Um, and so I just want to remind you that we have a little time, tight schedule, so please, if you would start uh, with your initial um, statements. Uh, Mrs. Kathleen Shea. Hello, good afternoon, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dragos for inviting me to this panel. And uh, let me just say once again, I'm extremely happy I am that events are back and we can have real conversations, look into each other's eye and uh, see each other below like this frame that is cut out of from Zoom. I'm just so happy, really. This is what brings back life to our democracy. Um, but regarding the invitation, uh, when I first received uh, the, the, the request first, I was a little bit uh, intimidated. I'm very bad with technology. I bought an Apple Watch and it took me half a day to set it up. I think a 10-year-old kid can do it in like 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, this is my starting point. But I also uh, have experiences which uh, really drove me uh, into engaging with this topic more. Before I got into politics, I worked as a doctor. And I remember the feeling... Uh, how it felt like when we first installed an AI-powered hearing kit uh, to a young boy with multiple disabilities and uh, with the help of this tool he could hear for the first time clearly. I remember the smile on his face and, and how, how much of an accomplishment it was for the, the whole, whole hospital and for the whole community. But I'm also from a country. I'm from Hungary, which is an EU member state, uh, and the country where Last year, a party member of mine was uh, taken uh, into police custody for a critical Facebook post where government policies were criticized. And uh, right now we are on the campaign trail. We have elections on Sunday. And I, uh, I have first-hand experience of people not willing to take our flyers in small towns because they are afraid that if somebody finds out that they are taking part in opposition activities, they can lose their jobs. And it really, truly gives me chills to think about how much more uh, power could modern technology give to oppressive governments. Uh, and in, in the line which mine is not even in the worst, among the worst, but still quite terrible, uh, to, to survey people and to exercise control over democracy if uh, the supervision is uh, not adequate. So, so for me, these are the starting points, the good and the bad. And the uh, topic of, of this current discussion is AI and democracy. And, and when I was thinking about it, I think the, the principle of democracy really comes down to accountability. If, if uh, something is done, then those who conduct it can be held accountable. Right now, uh, of course, in our current... Uh, systems, uh, politicians, governments uh, basically decide what is possible and what is not. What paths uh, can we walk down and what not? How can we apply for a pension? How can we get health care? Um, how can we uh, travel? Uh, what is possible and what is not? Uh, but we are getting into a reality where the digital also becomes political and uh, people who can code uh, can basically create and exercise policy. Um, and uh, it was a very good introduction by Minister Van Huffelen about the social security benefits uh, case, which really illustrates, I think, the, the dilemmas of the future. Uh, because, for instance, if somebody is denied coverage of... Uh, healthcare due to illnesses they have um, in a way that is uh, not fitting for the law. They can report it to the authorities. But what happens if it is done uh, based on an algorithm that uh, nobody knows it exists? Uh, what happens if uh, we just don't know how our lives are being uh, singled out or selected uh, by, by processes that uh, we do not uh, have an oversight over? Where is the accountability? Who makes the laws? Um, 
these are the, the dilemmas I think we have to ask every single time if uh, we are contemplating the use of a new technology. Uh, if the consumer is protected, uh, is the consumer able to exercise their democratic right uh, to scrutinize what happens to them? Uh, and this is the gigantic task of the legislator of today, to create a legislation for the technology of the future. Uh, but if we do not get it right, then... Uh, we are really opening up a big black box of, uh, of the unknown. And, and I, I believe, as politicians, our job is uh, to avoid big black boxes of unknown because citizens entrusted their, uh, their votes in us uh, in order to try to keep up, up, uphold uh, the, the so-called rule of law in every single process. And, and I believe uh, this is why it's absolutely uh, necessary uh, to not only look at the potential, which is clearly there, of innovation, of technology, of investment, but also look at those people uh, who are being affected by these technologies. So I am very much looking forward to an interesting conversation on this, uh, on this very big topic. And uh, thank you once more for having me here. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and, and this makes me think of our approach to AI in general. You know, I usually like to say that uh, the way we approach AI and the way we, we think of we can think of it as a management of risks to this kind of unique uh, power balances that we have in Europe in terms of uh, democracy. So thank you. Um, next speaker is Richard Youngs, um, please. Thank you, for the, thank you for the invitation. Um, as time is short, I just make one very specific argument, which is to argue that we should reverse the direction of how we understand the relationship between democracy and AI. We should start from an understanding of why our democracies are underperforming, what's needed for good quality democratic renewal, what we want from our democratic institutions, and map this analysis onto AI, rather than starting from uh, AI as a kind of a priori standalone issue. It's fully acknowledged now that AI is intrinsically neither good nor bad for democracy. It depends how it's used and crucially who decides on how it's used. The risks have been very exhaustively chronicled. We heard from the commissioner, from the minister, privacy infringement, surveillance, biases, and so on and so forth. There are still positive opportunities. AI is good at um, identifying popular dissatisfaction. It's good at aggregating uh, voters' preferences. It's good at uh, tracking government promises. It's good at increasing the efficiency of service delivery. So there are negatives and positives. The question that's normally posed is how do we get the positives without the negatives. That tends to be the approach that's taken by the EU and the ACT. But for me, the democracy question is different. It's deeper and it's more political. It's about starting from an understanding of what we want from our government institutions uh, and understanding that AI will change the kind of democracy we have, the way that democracy works. Democracy is responsive government, but it's also active democratic citizenship. You need both those things. The advantages of AI tend to be about responsive government, um, enabling governments to identify popular preferences and creating more of a direct link between citizens' preferences and policy outcomes. I think the question still is whether it can make a positive contribution to more active democratic citizenship as well. For me, that's crucial because that's the element where our democracies are underperforming at present. Um, so... In that sense, uh, the call is normally made for a, an AI that works in the public interest, for public interest criteria to be built into the way that AI works. This is important, but again, it's not the same thing for me as the democracy question. We can have AI that works in the public interest, but which still undermines active democratic citizenship. Indeed, the focus on efficient service delivery often tips into the argument that you can have an AI-driven government, efficient, responsive, but without particularly competitive forms of politics. So for me here, the risk is that AI pushes us towards a more individualized notion of democracy, a democracy which is good at identifying individual preferences and translating those into policy outcomes. This has benefit, but it also has a risk 
of undercutting and weakening the intermediary organizations that exist between the citizens and the government, which are equally as important for uh, democracy. Uh, an AI MP may be better than a human MEP or MP at identifying citizen preferences, but politics is also about building alliances, making trade-offs, understanding the complex relationship between different areas of policy issue. And I think there it's still uh, doubtful whether AI can actually make a positive contribution. Democracy is not simply a market mechanism for responding to citizen preferences. So my concluding thought is this, whether it's inevitable in the future that we have to accept some kind of trade-off between response, AI-driven responsive government on the, on the one hand and democracy understood as the, the way that we uh, relate to each other as individuals on the other hand, or whether AI can make a positive contribution to strengthening the consent in government, the consent in government, not simply processing policy preferences, but increasing the legitimacy of the way that we as citizens are governed, which ultimately is what democracy is about. I would suggest in a, as a practical policy step, at the minimum, this means we need a lot more uh, structured deliberation and participation specifically around the way that AI is used, the purposes to, what, to which we put AI. For me, AI should be a democratic outcome rather than vice versa, rather than us thinking about the technology of AI and its impact on democracy. Thank you. So democracy asking the questions, uh, enabling active citizenship. Um, I like that idea. Uh, Natalie, please, uh, your introductory remarks. Yeah, um, maybe let me start by saying how nice it is um, to have such a debate, not just in person, but also to have this kind of tone. When I first started with AI policy discussions um, a few years ago, there was no way that we were thinking about binding legislation, about talking about the risks. And I remember in these type of panels, I was always starting by saying, look, apologies, I'm the lawyer, and so I will focus on the risks of the technology. I hope that's okay. Um, so the tone really has changed, and unfortunately that's because there have been some open scandals. Um, but I have to be way less critical uh, than I thought I would be because I think um, people are learning from, from what is happening. So that's very encouraging. And that will be my positive note. So now on to the risks. Um, I think when we talk about AI and democracy, let me just reiterate democracy, what it means for us in Europe. Um, constitutionally speaking, democracy is part of this um, constitutional holy trinity in the EU, together with the rule of law and human rights. You cannot have democracy without respect for human rights and the rule of law and vice versa. You cannot have respect for the rule of law if you don't have a strong democracy. And the events that are taking place today just at the borders, but also, as you reminded us, inside our borders, are showing us that democracy is vulnerable. And that even in liberal democracies, you have a global tendency, in fact, for authoritarian tendencies that we need to take into account. And sure, AI is a tool. I would not say it's value neutral because the way in which we design it and use it has a great impact on, on its effects. Um, and when we talk about AI and democracy specifically, let me just point out three domains for which we need to be extra careful. Um, first domain would be the online public sphere. I think we all probably agree that social media today have become the modern public squares where we inform ourselves about public events, where we shape our public opinion about things, but also our political opinion. Um, and we heard that the European Commission is taking action in this field, that member states are taking action in this field, but of course, more work still needs to be done and the law can only go so far, right? Much more than a legal system is needed to, to take this into account. Then the second, um, domain that I think is very relevant when we talk about AI and democracy, it's not the online public sphere, but the physical public sphere. Because people are still protesting, peaceful democratic protests in the street, in public squares, and that is an essential part of democracy. And we know that AI is increasingly playing a role there, probably the best example 
would be the whole discussion we're having on facial recognition systems. It's unavoidable, I think, in, in such a panel. When we talk about facial recognition, um, surveillance, privacy infringements, even uh, infringements of the right to non-discrimination often pop up. But of course it has a huge impact on democracy as well and that is perhaps less discussed. If you can use facial recognition technology to identify which people were protesting against a government policy, you have a very powerful weapon in your hand. And of course there are some safeguards currently in the AI Act so you can only use it in public places um, in certain uh, exceptions. One of these exceptions is to capture suspects, but then the question is, of course, how do you define what is a suspect or a criminal? To which extent can political crimes play a role in that? And then the other safeguard is, of course, also that in principle there should be a judicial warrant to make use of such systems, but we know that in the European Union we have some problems with judicial independence in some instances. So it's very important to think about these safeguards in the longer term before we start implementing an infrastructure. And then the third uh, domain um, is, of course, um, the fact that the public sector itself is increasingly relying on AI systems. And of course, lots of potential efficiencies, cost benefits, um, mass decision-making that administrations can do and potentially also combat corruption, for instance, because you don't have civil servants anymore necessarily who might be able to deviate public money elsewhere. At the same time, you're replacing it with an automatized system that can make mass decisions with scale and speed, potentially in ways that do not correspond to EU values, to democracy, to the rule of law. Who translates language-based legal policies to code. Often public sector use of AI is dependent on the private sector that develops it for them. Who does this translation? Who has the expertise? How many of our public services in the EU have the expertise in-house to translate legal frameworks into code and then use it for citizens? So there are important questions there. Um, and I'll stop here. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, yes, uh, thinking of is it working? Yes. Thinking of time, we have to be a little bit, little bit quick because I know, Dragos, in a little bit you have to go and, and, and pick up our next keynote speaker. But please, if you have some comments here and also some questions for our panelists. Well, thank you. Uh, the good news is I don't have to step out uh, and look for our keynote speaker because she's right here. Uh, so welcome very much. Exactly. Well, first Vice President. Well, Light in my eyes. <laughs> um, in fact, I will defer my, my right of abuse as, as host and actually ask uh, the minister first for, uh, for her reaction to some of the things that we've heard. I think very interesting reflections, first of all, with, with how we regard democracy and, and how actually AI is going to impact long term, five years, ten years from now, actually how our democracies function. And honestly, when I chose this topic to put it on the agenda, I chose it precisely with this in mind. How is actually AI technology generally now is going to impact how our democracies are going to function? Hopefully we're still going to remain democracies in 10 years time and even longer. But what does it mean, f well, what does it mean also for the states? How will the states as the providers of services, as the providers and the guarantors of democracy, how will themselves need to evolve to basically cater for the needs of their citizens as long as they remain engaged citizens, the second condition that you mentioned, Richard, for democracy. So very, I think very deep considerations that you've put forward there. So again, I will leave the minister the floor first for, for her reactions to, to these, and then if there's time, I'll give some thoughts of mine. Thank you. Well, super, thank you. And I, I'll make it quick, because I think most of us are very, are realizing very well that we need to regulate and think about the way how we are going to regulate it and make sure that this regulation is going to be as flexible as necessary. The point that you were making, Richard, is also another point. So it's not only about the services provided by government and how you can make sure that AI works in the right way and avoid all the things that go wrong, which we discussed in, uh, earlier in the, in the examples you were giving, the examples Mr. Jurova was giving, the examples you know, of my case in the Netherlands, but also to see how we can use AI to make people more, well, involved in democracy. 
And I think this is a field that we have not developed enough, um, but is super important because it's going to help us make people not only trust their government, but make sure that they are going to be more, be more involved in the democratic debate and not on the basis of the idea that you do some bit of surveys because you were right saying that that is, of course, um, not enough to have a real political debate. It's not just about, you know, who, who is pro that, and if it's more than 75 percent, then we'll do it or not. Um, the things that I, I very much liked about what you were saying also, uh, Natalie, was also that you mean you were talking about loads of safeguards that we still need to work on. And I think it's going to be very important in the coming and upcoming debates to make sure that these safeguards are going to be in in the government, mainly also by making sure that we, if we work with private companies that make stuff for us, which we are going to do, we're already doing it, that we have enough knowledge and understanding of what we are doing. Um, this is not what we're doing today. This is exactly also why the AI system that I was working in in the Netherlands went wrong. And then, of course, um, um, uh, this debate is not finalized yet, but we need to work on that far, uh, far more. Um, just to conclude on what you were asking, uh, Dragos, and thank you very much again for, for um, being able to participate, is this idea of getting more knowledge, having more debates, making sure that the human-centric approach to AI is going to stay and not use it if we can't be sure that it's you know, completely up to, the, to everything that we need is, um, I can guess, one of the most important things. Um, and speed up getting all the, the regulation in, in place. Um, you uh, from the parliament can work on that as well, I think. Thank you. I think I would like to invite uh, if any of the other panelists would like to comment on the... No? Yes? I, mean, I, okay. I didn't want to give too positive or buoyant a view. I, sh I share very much Natalie's uh, the court more cautious side of your remarks. And I think Dragos's point is very, very important. I think um, we're, we're just in the foothills of this debate about how AI will reshape our politics. And I think it's very difficult to predict how things will go. But I'm sure in five years' time, we will, we will need to be debating things beyond what we're debating at the moment about surveillance and privacy infringements and AI biases and, and the like. Um, it, I think there is a risk there that it's not so much whether AI will displace democracy uh, per se. There is a risk of AI-driven authoritarianism, the kind of Chinese model, we know that. But I think it will more subtly reshape the way that democracy works in many ways that are beneficial, but also that raise the risk of a kind of democracy of passive citizenship, which I think would, would go against a lot of the principles for which the EU stands. But I think the good news is there is emerging work on how AI tools can actually help processes of more active deliberation, how it can actually help strengthen the links between direct citizen participation on the one hand and MPs on the other hand. And I think that it's, it's, we're only in the early stages of that, but I think that is the more positive side that could be explored. Can I, can I pull this? At the last panel, I, I took everything from a global discussion uh, into a European uh, context. And now I would like to think about how we have uh, you know, an AI act and we have a regulatory framework being proposed. Uh, we have a discussion about democratic values and standards. How can we, um, uh, how can we be the standard setters in, uh, on a global level? Uh, recently, there was the democratic values index um, uh, artificial Intelligence and Democratic Values Index from uh, from the Center of, uh, of uh, AI and Digital Policy that came out that ranked 30 countries all over the world with different criteria. There were things like, uh, did the country endorse the AI, uh, the OECD principles? Did they implement AI strategies? Did they endorse UNESCO ethics uh, recommendations? Uh, meaningful participation in national AI uh, uh, policy development, uh, things like these. Uh, is there a kind of a role for uh, uh, maybe a, a global uh, governance benchmark that EU can, can push forward? Uh, I may be leading the discussion here. Um, I can see you're nodding. Yes, uh, I... 100% sure that if uh, there will be global governance standards in terms of values when it comes to AI, it will come from the EU. Uh, usually we have a history of uh, being the ones 
leading uh, on on the human rights and values component of policies. Maybe not on other aspects, uh, but this is our edge globally. And if we can work together as a community of values and we can give... Uh, we, we can use the market power of our almost 400 million citizens, then uh, we, 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 we can be the ones and the only ones who can uh, introduce the humane aspect uh, in this term of uh, legislation. And I, I, I think it's like absolutely essential that the EU lives up to this role and uh, leads just like we lead on the GDPR, for instance. Thank you. And this... Um what I've heard others saying before about the EU is the participatory process and the participation in, in democratic processes. Uh, Natalie, maybe I, you know, in terms of also the AI high-level group, which had 52 experts that were laying the grounds for, for at least the ethical uh, foundation. Um, do, you, do you want to comment quickly on, on maybe this particular aspect? Um, yeah, I think we've shown also with the work with the high-level expert group that debate works. I mean, we had very tough debates in the expert group. We had very different people sitting around the table. And I think that is definitely a strength in Europe to show that even though sometimes democracy is less efficient than autocracy, and I think we need to be also honest in that, but efficiency is not necessarily the value that we are striving for. We want efficiency towards our values, towards individual and societal well-being. And so that is the core that we need to um, protect. With benchmarks, I think you know, that's definitely a good idea, but it's always a bit difficult, I think, to quantify and put metrics on these qualitative aspects like the rule of law and democracy. It's a necessary exercise and it can definitely be a stimulator. Um, and it also acknowledges the importance that we attach to it. But in that spirit, what I would like to push back a little bit on is that, yes, Europe is setting the standard now with this AI Act, and hopefully we can make this part of a global standard. But we are here in a discussion on democracy and AI. And so I would like to have a stronger push for the EU agenda to also encompass these societal interests and societal harms raised by the technology. Because right now, I think we're doing a relatively good job in looking at the human rights impact, um, but not yet about these longer term democratic rule of law aspects um, that are still missing from the debate because they're less tangible. It's perhaps a more difficult discussion to have, but we need to also think of legal safeguards for that. Thank you. Dragos. I'm going to go back to you. Well, I'll make it very simple uh, because uh, also looking at the time, uh, I think we're getting close to the, to the time allocated for this panel. And I think uh, I'll reserve for my closing some of the takeaways that I, that I have from, from this conversation. Um, I, maybe I would really want to thank the minister. I would really want to thank Katka and, 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 and uh, Richard and Natalie for their for their insights, uh, and I know maybe a final thought uh, as to how you see yourselves, uh, the future. It is very much the, about the future, this conference. Um, and I would really like, at the very end, to leave with some ideas, I think all of us, as to how the world would look in 2030 in terms of a world driven very much by technology, driven by, very much by, by AI. Um, and I think if you could do it in one minute, that would be absolutely splendid. Thank you. Richard, uh, you looked so surprised that I'll be mean and, and let you start. I, I really have no kind of <laughs> template for 2030, I mean, not even next week, but I, I would say I think one really interesting thing that's gone on uh, to the EU's credit over the last few months is the uh, participatory dimension of the Conference on the Future of Europe. It hasn't been without its uh, flaws. Uh, we still don't know exactly uh, what, to what end purposes it will be put, uh, but I can see that that kind of template were it to be replicated on a more systematic basis across Europe could be useful in drawing this tighter nexus between good quality democratic renewal and reform on the one hand and a kind of socially responsible public interest oriented use of AI on the other. It won't completely iron out the tensions. I don't think we, we there will be no democratic model that will iron out those tensions. But we need, we need a kind of participatory and inclusive way of managing those tensions in the future. That, that ultimately is the, the point of democracy. It's not about doing away with tensions and differences. It's having 
um, a legitimized way of dealing with these tensions. Thank you, and I'll go quickly, as because we're almost done with the panel, but yes. thank you. Natalie. I'll, um, I'll take the excuse to um, give some recommendations, so what I would ideally like to see by 2030. I think more research is needed definitely on the societal aspects rather than just the human rights aspect, and so ideally there is more funding for that. Uh, more public participation, indeed, more opportunities for participation on how and when and if AI is used. Perhaps also when we talk about impact assessment, think about not only making a human rights impact assessment, but a human rights, democracy and rule of law impact assessment where it is relevant, because we also need to take that into account. And perhaps at longer term have a sort of EU observatory that gathers information about how the use of AI positively and negatively impacts the rule of law and democracy. We have a rule of law framework with a yearly rule of law report. Maybe it's time to also implement some digital components into that. Look at how the use of digital technologies can affect that. And then of course having a super good and strong AI act with proper legal safeguards, still a bit better than today, and uh, that would be an ideal 2030. Thank you. Mrs. Yeah, thank you. So, so one of the greatest things that I believe that we should strive for is people that have faith and trust in their government. And that is because they, and you were speaking about this, they can influence the decisions and they feel that their voice is being heard but also if they believe that their government is still in control and it's not out of control because of you know, AI that is going to um, rule not only their world, but also go going to rule their government. So I believe the central focal point would be trust because of influence and because they know um, things are not out of hand, but in control. And I don't mean in control in a negative way, of course. Thank you, and the final remarks? Well. Honestly, I have absolutely no idea how our world will look like, uh, not only in 20, 30 years, but in like two or three. Uh, this is how fast uh, the technology around us develops. Uh, what I can say with quite a lot of confidence that uh, within the time frame that uh, you proposed, uh, it's quite sure that technological companies, uh, the big ones will have almost as much powers as governments or even more. Uh, it's, I will be quite sure that coders and programmers will have almost as much uh, power as politicians or even more. And the question is, how do we cope with this? How do we regulate this? Can we make our politics future-proof? Can we re uh, respond to these uh, challenges as legislators? Will there be accountability or... Uh, uh, will there be a parallel system uh, developing next to our traditional systems of governance uh, that we just uh, watch with great interest from far away? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, fantastic panel. Uh, and um, yes, so I'll just, uh, we'll start the closing session now. Please everyone stay seated because we will go straight into our last keynote speaker. The Vice Executive Vice President, Margrethe Vestager. And first, let, let me do that. Let you introduce. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gri. Uh, I came up here because this is, uh, in a way, the grand finale for, for today. Uh, I'm really happy uh, to welcome uh, first Executive Vice President uh, Margrethe Vestager. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, you have the floor. Uh, we are very much eager to, to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I know no one likes a spoiler, but uh, the theme of what I, I will say, the, the question I will try to answer, uh, also the question that Dragas uh, asked in the end, where are we going? Well, the point of everything we do is to build trust, because that is the secret ingredient in Europe, that you can trust other people that you can trust authorities, and that you can trust your democracy to deliver. Thank you very much for this invitation. 
And thank you to you, uh, Dragos, hosting us uh, today, because these are the kind of conferences we need, coming together, getting wiser, having more insights, the necessary disturbances to make us all wake up by the end of the day. And I think the work uh, that was done in the special committee uh, under your leadership, uh, Tudor, I think a lot has been achieved. From artificial intelligence being something maybe a bit vague to something center of attention, but something that you trust yourself to be able to deal with. I think the work of the committee is also part of giving our democracy the self-confidence that, of course, we can set the framework for technology. This is not foreign for democracy. This is not something we should be scared of. This is not something we should leave to the business community. No, it's part and parcel of democratic legitimacy also to set the direction and to set the framework for this. And these weeks, when we remind it every day that democracy comes with a price, that democracy is something that we should fight for, here we do our best with the sanctions, with hosting refugees, but the encouragement of the Ukrainian bravery and their courage should also inspire us to use our democracy in full because they are willing to pay the biggest price for having it. So we need to dive in because even though part of our brain and all of our heart is in Ukraine, everything else continues. The digital development continues. As we speak, there are coders all over, you know, improving artificial intelligence, inventing new forms of artificial intelligence. As we speak, climate change continues. CO2 doesn't care about war. So we need to push on with all the things we were doing already, and not only to push on, we need to accelerate. We need to accelerate what we do when it comes to the digital transformation to make sure that we serve our citizens, their security, their opportunities, their ways of making a living. And we need to accelerate the green transition in order to gain the, um, the independence from Russian fuels. So it is indeed key what we do when we pay attention to security, defense, democracy, to our elections, how they work. Artificial intelligence has huge potential. We see it already. We see how health can be improved, how diagnostics can be improved. We see the potential in, in helping us to, to, fight climb, to fight crime and to fight climate change. We see how artificial intelligence can enable technology to do things that was not possible before, to support our decision making. But there is a certain reluctance, I think you can surely say. If you ask people what you think, a lot of people, they will hesitate. They say, mm, can it be trusted? Can we trust the authorities who put it in place that they want to do the right thing? And this is, of course, why our mission is to build trust in technology. Because this is the only way to open markets for artificial intelligence to be used. Here in Europe, we have huge public sectors. They deliver health, culture, uh, employment benefits, uh, help to get into the uh, labor market, all kinds of very, very advanced services. If that market is open for the use of artificial intelligence, it's a giant market. But as it was just said here in this panel, 
if you don't trust it, if, you don't, if you're not really careful, you will break trust instead of build trust. And we should have the courage not to put things into effect if we're not sure how it will work. I think that is really, really good advice. And the need for trust is not unique to artificial intelligence. We need to trust our car when we uh, pull the brake. We need to trust an online shop when they deliver goods to us that we can actually complain about things that are not as they were, were supposed to be and that initially that that shop is a real shop that actually do care about uh, the qualities of the produce that they are sending us. So we need to make sure that we work on trust in everything we do. And all of this just to say why we have proposed the AI Act. Uh, you will know it, uh, I think, in, in great level of detail. But just to say that one of the fundamental choices made in that AI Act is not to regulate the technology, but to regulate the use of technology. And the reason why this is important is that then this act will be relevant for many more people than those who code. Because it will be relevant for everyone who wants to use it, no matter your profession. Which is also why we hope that this act will open the eyes for many more outside of the tech community to see this is relevant for us. We should develop our expertise to know what we're dealing with. And thank you very much for using the pyramids as, uh, as the token for our conference uh, today. Because that pyramid is indeed the second choice that we made, that when we want to regulate the use, well, it's the top of the pyramid we want to regulate. While you find the very few things that should be in principle prohibited, because they have no home in a European culture. And under that, those very few things to be prohibited, the things that imply a risk of some of our fundamentals. And here that the use cases, well, they should be uh, assessed for conformity uh, with the different requirements before they're put into use. And thanks to this, these choices made, this horizontal risk-based approach, and of course incorporating and building on existing product legislation framework, well, we hope to do something that is actually top of mind with us, that it's also relevant for smaller businesses, and that's also relevant for those who are really, really angry with admin, which is, I think, most of us, because who loves admin? So trying to achieve something fundamental, but do it in a way that makes it relevant for those who need it. Not too heavy, not too burdensome, but focused on where we find risks and making that risk assessment relevant for many more than the tech community. And building trust in technology, here the AI Act is one big part of the puzzle. Second one would be the Digital Markets Act, where we had the political agreement last week. And the third one would be uh, the Digital Services Act. Increasing our negotiations tomorrow and in the weeks to come. And this has also to do with trust. Trust that what our democracy have decided should be illegal offline is also illegal and treated as illegal when online. No matter if it's uh, goods, services, or content. And it is, it is a fundamental thing that you can trust that what is online and offline is treated the same way. Because, of course, digital started small, but then it enlarged. For many people, digital is six, seven, eight hours of their day, if not more not just sitting by a computer, but in a space of your social contacts, of, uh, of your shopping, of how you exercise, of how you connect with family and friends. 
And for that space also to have democratic legitimacy, well, of course, the Dinsu Services Act addresses that to make sure that it actually works and that we know why things are happening. For instance, why we see a certain act, in particular, of course, if it's a political one. So we do think that with the law, we can build trust. But of course, if the law is just on paper, well, not so much trust will be built in the end. And this is, of course, why the way we deal with it is, is, is of importance. How it's being enforced, but also what the rest of the world uh, is doing. So let me end with this, because there's that huge potential for growth, for jobs to be created, if we invest and if we create trust. Of course, the AI Act is a kind of a first worldwide. Countries and stakeholders uh, around the world, they're looking at what it is that we will make happen here. And we are already seeing, starting to see, parts of the US and countries uh, like China producing rules that address some of the same issues. And that I find to be really encouraging because AI is a global phenomenon. And since we do not have global jurisdictions, the fact that we align our minds and do the best we can in the jurisdiction where we do work, that is promise. And we have established, I think, a very constructive debate with the US administration uh, about technologies in the tech and technology, trade and technology council. And both the US administration and us, we believe that artificial technology, artificial intelligent technology, well, they have the potential to bring benefits to citizens, to societies, to economies. But we also share the risk-based approach, that there is something that we need to address for all of that potential ever to come true. So we are now following up on the ambitious tasking we agreed in Pittsburgh in September last year, notably when it comes to the principles for trustworthy AI. When it comes to the development of privacy-enhancing technologies, we do an economic study on the impact, impact of AI on the workforce. We try to develop concrete uh, tools for uh, making it a real thing that we can trust AI. And we also share the same approach when it comes to social scoring. In principle, not a thing that would have a home in a democracy. We'll meet again in mid-May in France, not only to continue our discussions, but hopefully also to conclude uh, on some of these issues. We can build trust in the law. We can build trust internationally. We can build trust in enforcing. Most importantly, we build trust when we come together, listening to each other, learning from each other. And Dragas, I think your leadership in the AIDA committee is really instrumental. Because it's a given the trust, I think, among the legislature that this is something that we can do. Because the risk scenario that Kathleen drew in the last panel, that is a real risk. That democracy will not stand its ground, but leave it to gigantic companies to set the rules of the digital world. And that risk is what we are addressing right now to state the legitimacy of our democracy to make sure that in your digital world, in your physical world, what we decide in our democracy is real. Because no matter where you are, that is life for you. And a life built on trust that our democracy will assume the responsibility, this is where we want to go. Thank you very much.
Well, <laughs> impossible act to follow. Um, not to mention that I know that you are looking forward to the drinks and food that are coming in a couple of minutes. So um, I think I'll make my team very unhappy. I will abandon my speech that I had prepared for the end. By the way, I want to thank my team, uh, Timia, Dan, Ligia, Tudor, and, and, and Mihai for all helping me organize this. So instead of my speech, <laughs> so instead of my prepared speech, which remains somewhere over there, I'll use the block note that I actually filled. I don't know about you, but I filled the block note with, with notes and observations and, and, and thoughts and ideas. Um, to maybe focus on two reflections, um, two personal reflections on today's conversations and three takeaways. Uh, very concrete takeaways uh, that I also plan to actually put in writing and, and maybe address them in a letter. Dear Margarete, I hope you won't mind. Uh, address them in a letter to the European Commission. So first, the two reflections. I think we need to grow particularly us as politicians, we need to grow a reflex of thinking about AI and technology in general 360 degrees. It's no longer a thing for the techies. It's no longer a thing for the ministries of digitalization. Sorry, Minister, for saying that. I think we absolutely need to start thinking with a whole of a government, whole of society approach to AI. And that is because everything that you've just said, listen today. The, the, the impact that AI is going to have on everything we do and how it's going to shape that 2030 that I put up there in my question, that should be a concern for everybody. And therefore, again, when we think of AI, we need to think at everything, at labor market, at education, at transport, at energy, at absolutely everything that our governments, that us as politicians, regulators, need to prepare in terms of policy outlook and policy projections for the future. And also, while doing that, we cannot afford blind spots. We cannot, to be, we cannot afford to wake up one day again in a state of dependency towards anybody. I think someone mentioned today and gave the example of what it means for us now as a European Union waking up to the dependence we have on Russian oil and gas. We don't want that when it comes to technology, or at least I think we should not want that when it comes to technology. And also, I don't think we cannot afford to be naive anymore about the world order and the state of affairs in the world. We also thought up until about two months ago that Russia will stay put. No one conceived that we will actually be going through the kind of war that we see now every evening on the television. And yet we're there. So again, I don't think we can, speaking now particularly about the first topic of our conversation, the geopolitics of AI and the impacts on defense and security, again, we cannot afford such, na such naiveties. And therefore, while we think and while we invest and while we prepare our union alongside our partners and like-minded countries out there, again, we need to put this very serious thinking cap on and plan ahead, and I'll come concrete to some of those reflections as well, uh, on, on, on those concrete proposals as well. My second reflection is linked to the second topic, which is democracy. I cannot say it better than Margrethe Vestager, no matter how much I try, but democracy is at the heart of, at least that's how I see it as a rapporteur. I hope I won't be creating <laughs> to many people upset today, but as a rapporteur for the AI Act, I think this act is not about product safety. It is technically about product safety, but I like to regard it as actually being about how our democracy is going to look like 10 years from now. And therefore, in the way I'm going to shape my work as co-rapporteur for this, 
particularly as co-rapporteur on behalf of the Civil Liberties Committee, I'm going to use it as an opportunity, again, to shape the legislative basis for this technology that is going to help our evolution as democracies. Because I believe that this is about our values and the values that we believe in, and therefore, again, in also the outreach that we do towards partners, just as uh, Margaret Hevestaga was saying, this is something that has to remain at the core of what we do. And now I come to the three very concrete takeaways that I picked up in the conversations today. The first, linking to the first panel, the first is interoperability. I don't think we can afford to start, and I think now we are, starting to consider the strengthening of our defense union, further investments in, in defense equipment and, in, uh, and, and, and industry without thinking about how we make that and how we do that in an interoperable fashion with also what US and generally what NATO is doing. And we also need to think, we were saying earlier in our panel, we need to think of how we use dual use technologies, particularly when it comes to AI, to the algorithms that can equally power a civilian system as well as a military weapon system. How do we shape that up and how do we actually prepare rules knowing that in our AI, AI Act we do not set standards for defense? So one concrete proposal for me, one concrete takeaway for me is that we need a place we need a structure where we start discussing interoperability between the US and the EU and interoperability at, at NATO level. We heard earlier Deputy Secretary General mentioning Diana, uh, this sort of uh, innovation hub, which is, from what I understood, also very much meant to achieve that. And if that is going to see the light of day and is going to have these objectives, I think that's already a very important step forward. The second concrete takeaway is money and the size of money. Um, also one of our panelists, or, or two of them, were mentioning the need to think big, to have large projects, to have maybe a portfolio that is dedicated to large projects. Yes, the conversation was about defense, but I think we need that not only for defense, we need that also for civilian purposes. I said in other occasions that I think we need the equivalent of landing on the moon some 50, 60 years ago. And we need that in technology AI terms. We need to set moonshot objectives and we need to be able to fund them because that will also have, I think, the effect of gathering talent around these big projects. I think we also heard the word talent earlier in our conversation today, an absolutely key driver for how technology is going to evolve and how we can stay competitive in this area. And if we want to attract talent and to retain talent here in Europe, again, we need to give them beacons. We need to give them beacons of excellence around which people would like to actually stay and grow and invest and develop and educate and work. Otherwise, sorry to say, they will be leaving. And the third concrete takeaway for me is, I think someone just used the word observatory. I don't know whether it was Natalie or, or Gris, but someone used the word EU observatory, and I actually like that word, and I would add to it an EU observatory for democracies in 2030. <laughs> We can give it another name, but anyway, the idea behind it would be that I do think that we need to start reflecting very seriously at the impact of artificial intelligence, but not only uh, the impact on our democracies. And it's not only about how political rallies and political campaigning is going to look like five or 10 years from now with heavily AI-powered social media algorithms and information that we take in a completely different fashion than what we do today and the way we interact with each other being completely changed 
I think, by, by the evolution of, the, of technology. So all that is going to have an impact on the two key elements that I think Richard mentioned, one of them being responsive governments and the second being participative citizens. So I think we need to start measuring, we need to start preparing for that outcome. We cannot just move along and wait for things to happen. I think we need to start for trying to, to anticipate them. And while we think in this observatory for democracy for the future, I also need to start thinking, as I also said earlier, of what the role of states, of what the role of governments in these new shapes of democracies would be. What if in 10 years' time, all of the services, all of the services that, that are being provided to our citizens are going to come from private entities, even those that right now are state monopolies? What would be the role of state then? Why would we be still electing politicians? To what end? I think there will still be an end to it, by the way. But still, again, I think there will be changes to also how, again, politics and how states are run. And I think, again, that we start, need to start anticipating what those changes will be. And that also includes how lawmaking will be done 10 years from now. How we'll actually be adopting laws and writing laws that will be fitting to the subject matter that they are trying to address, which is technology in already the 10th, 20th, millionth evolution from what we know today. Is our lawmaking still equipped for that? It's very rigid. It doesn't allow for adaptation maybe here, here and there. By the time you actually end up negotiating it, speaking of how long it will take for the AI Act, by the time you end up negotiating it, already what you're trying to cover with the text has already leaped five times over. So again, I think that such an observatory for 2030, for how our democracies look like, is an essential piece for our ability to forecast where we're going to go. So with these thoughts, I want to thank you once more for being patient for two hours and a half. Uh, I don't know for you, but for me it passed rather quickly. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the speakers. Uh, thank you once more, uh, dear Margrethe, for, for, for making time and, and being with us. And the happy moment, drinks and nibbles somewhere in the corner over there. And the most awaited networking opportunity, something that we haven't been able to do for two years. And I know you're looking forward to do that. So thank you very much and, and have a good rest of the day.